He was the instigator of the war, and they said about him that he conquered four kingdoms, which means he became a cold-blooded tyrant. Royal blood flowed in his veins, but he was still considered an illegitimate child, born of a monster. It was rumored that he had to appear with his face covered even at his own wedding. The mistress and the maid were riding in the carriage, and she told the lady that perhaps the man would never be able to show his face, and she was not sure that he could even properly accompany her. She believed that marriage was a very tedious task. The girl agreed with her. After all, her father even sent a nanny to look after her, even though the girl has already grown up and been married twice. The maid coughed, and then she advised the girl in any case to do as her father told her. The noble animal's hooves clopped rhythmically along the road. One of the accompanying knights shared a rumor that they are going to a large estate on infertile land. He said it was better to hope that no monsters would appear. And then a deafening explosion was heard. The carriage shook considerably. The girl looked out the window cautiously. The knights accompanying her dismounted and surrounded the carriage with the lady to repel the attack. The maid was scared. She told the lady that if they died, it would only be together. She argued that if the gentleman found out that even a hair had fallen from her head, then they would all be in trouble. At that time, a wolf-like monster of enormous size was peeping through the carriage window. The girl noticed the fear in the maid's eyes and turned to the window. She pressed herself against the servant's shoulder in fear, thinking that it was all over for them all. There was a clink of metal. The toothy monster was pierced through the chest from behind by a sword blade. The girl looked out the window, and a broad-shouldered man in light armor looked into it, Blood spilled out in patches from the wounded monster. The maid felt sick from the emotions she had experienced. The girl looked at the savior with wide eyes, unable to say anything to him. She voiced the assumption that he was the same duke, and if not, then she asked for forgiveness. The girl dared to get out of the carriage. She explained that she had not yet seen the duke, so she might not have recognized him. The man visibly shuddered, although he was strong in spirit. Lady Lily could not understand the reason for the man's silence, it was strange to see him hesitate. After all, he himself was able to defeat such a monster alone. The girl could also assume that he could be some kind of commander or lead a battalion. The man turned his head, looking around. Another one in a burgundy raincoat came up and said that there were problems. It was discovered that a fairly large monster was hiding here. The man claimed that, unfortunately for him, they still had business here, and he didn't know what to do with this lady. Then he stared with the piercing gaze of his gray eyes at Lady Lily. He decided to connect the others and escort Miss to her destination. The girl asked the seer to forgive her. She clarified that he was going to fight the monster alone. He silently looked into the distance, lost in thought. Lily understood that it might take an entire order of knights to defeat the huge beast. Therefore, she asked me not to go to certain death alone because of her. In the carriage, the maid finally came to her senses. She ran out to meet the mistress. She asked if she was injured. It was impossible to allow even a scratch on her body. The man was holding a horse by the bridle. They called him Talon. Mr. Duke asked to see that his wife reached the castle, and he himself was going to stay here and take care of the monster. He accepted the order. He also asked to deal with this maid. It was visible from a distance how the maid ordered the mistress to obey. She roughly shook off the girl's dress, complaining that she didn't even realize how much it cost. The man was handsome, brunette with wide-set steel-colored eyes. A powerful jaw and a fairly thin nose complemented his aristocratic profile. The girl didn't know who he was, and should she be wary of him? The man on horseback left without saying goodbye to the ladies. It was already the dead of night. The moon and stars brightly illuminated the huge and magnificent ducal palace. He shone in the starlight, as if he himself were from a thousand stars. The maid carefully blindfolded her mistress. The girl asked if it was true that she couldn't see his face. The servants replied that this was the duke's order. The stern-looking maid warned the mistress that she should under no circumstances try to see his face until their wedding night is over. She bowed and left the room, clicking the lock. Lady Lily thought she would be treated much worse. She never would have thought that she would spend her wedding night like this. She turned to the sound of the door closing and asked what would happen if she did see his face. She was wearing a dark robe, and her eyes were tightly blindfolded with a black ribbon. But there was complete silence around the girl. Her question was lost under the high arch of the room, remaining unanswered but then the loud footsteps of heavy shoes were heard. Lily asked who was there. The man's bass voice answered her mockingly. That his wife turns out to be a very curious coward. She flinched when she heard him. She stuttered and called her husband, his lordship. Her feet were bare and her legs were naked. A male figure approached the girl. Lily's body was shaking. It was like the wind rushed past her, and a large hand with tenacious and strong fingers was already hugging her waist. 
She began to touch his torso. She asked who he was. The man turned her to face him and pressed her to his chest. He asked Lily if she was waiting for him. The girl was lying on the bed in a supine position. The man was on top of her, leaning on the bed with one hand and holding her hands with the other. She asked him to untie her eyes. The man said that unfortunately, he could not allow that to happen. He grabbed her foot and pressed her against his body, spreading her knees apart. The girl said that she had been waiting for him all this time. He let go of her hands and pressed one of her hands to his face, asking if it was true that she was waiting for him. Lily replied that it was so. After all, she really wanted to see him. Lily touched his face with the tips of her thin and graceful fingers. Then she carefully stroked the eyelids. She noted to herself that the man had surprisingly soft skin, as if for someone to whom the battlefield had become a second home. The girl touched his nose and lips. She thought that her husband must be good-looking, and she didn't understand why he needed to hide his own face. The duke said that apparently, he should now reward her for her languid and patient wait. The girl tried to pull her hand out of his grip. The man was holding the girl's head from behind. He needed her shoulders from behind. She said that she did not need his caresses, and she turned away. The man said that he was already ready. He unbuttoned his shirt with one hand, and with the other he held the girl by the shin, pressing her to his thigh. And he expressed the hope that she was also prepared. The morning sun shone dazzlingly brightly through the window. The fire crackled cheerfully in the fireplace, and Lady Lily was still basking under the covers in her bed, moaning languidly from the sensations after her wedding night. When she fully woke up, she began to remember the details of that night. He kissed her passionately on the lips. At some point, she forgot that she was blindfolded. For the first time, the girl felt calm, without feeling pain. The fingers of his hand penetrated her fingers, joining together. To the girl's surprise, she felt good then. She sat under the blanket and was a little sad. That night, the Duke didn't even insert into her. And now, remembering my past husbands, their rude treatment in their intimate moments, she understood that her new husband, she couldn't even imagine what he could do to her. She drove these thoughts away from herself. After all, a lady shouldn't think about such obscene things. She looked around, and only now did she realize that he was not here. Lady Lily swung her feet off the bed to put on soft slippers. She knew that even though there were rumors, the Duke was like a monster. But for her, everything was different. She was about to look outside the doors and look for where her maid was. She thought that nothing would happen if she left the room like that. But when she collided with another maid in the corridor, right out of the door, she got scared. The maid, also in fright, dropped the tray with a crash, along with what she was carrying, right onto the floor. Lady Lily was surprised and frightened. The maid had a prosthetic instead of a leg. The girl stuttered and apologized to her mistress. She said she was sorry, that she could have hurt her because of her carelessness. The lady looked with wide eyes at what was happening, still confused. The maid once again asked the lady to forgive her. She explained that at present, most of the maids were absent. That's why she came to help the lady. At the same time, she was trembling all over. Lily asked if she was hurt. The maid asked for forgiveness. The lady sat down next to her and smiling expressed the hope that the fragments did not hit her legs. The girl assured that not at all. The mistress looked with clear green eyes at the maid. She reminded her of her brothers and sisters. They also always worry when she is clumsy. She said that there was no need to apologize for such a trifle. Besides, the maid was scared because of her. The girl was touched by the kindness of the lady. It seemed to her that the aura next to her was sparkling, and she herself was like an angel. Lady Lily walked through the winter garden of the Duke's palace. She recalled how, the day after her wedding to her second husband, she spent the entire day lying in bed, exhausted. And now she enjoyed the greenery of rare plants and the company of a kind and helpful maid, completely in excellent spirits and well-being. And that time no one even brought her her clothes, and all that time she was alone in the room completely naked. And it was clear that the maids did not perceive her as a mistress, and they considered her an ordinary commoner from the courtyard. In conversation, Lily led the maid to introduce herself to her by name. The girl's name was Lucia. The lady thanked her, that she showed her such a wonderful place. She truly appreciated her concern and help today. Lucia remarked to herself that their duke must have married an angel, not a human. And if we talk about the gentleman, then this was quite possible. Lily sat down on a chair. She asked Lucia to say what kind of person she thought the Duke was. She replied that he was simply wonderful. She said that everyone knows that for people like her, life is already a miracle. For disabled people, getting married or just working quietly is difficult because of condemnation from the outside. 
but their benevolent duke hires completely different people and pays them generously, although he could be quite strict. He said that if anyone bothered his wife, he would kill him. But I still considered him the kindest in the whole world. The girl didn't know, but the duke deliberately left her in his chambers, and he called the priest because she had a fever. Lily was surprised to hear about the fever, feeling her forehead just in case. She staggered a little, and the maid was dumbfounded. The priest yelled, Madam, he ran down the corridor. The girl was lying on the bed. She was unconscious. The duke asked what happened. He demanded specifics. He was interested in the cause of her illness. His priest again repeated to the master that she was completely healthy, and I was absolutely sure that the walk to the greenhouse was not the reason. That in fact that meeting with the monster on the way to the estate could have shocked and frightened her. And after the stress he experienced, the duke also found time to engage in lovemaking at night. One wounded the man in the head, and the other in the heart. He expressed hope that everything would be fine with her. The priest assured that it would be so, so that he would not even worry. He stated that the mortality rate among patients with fever is high, but he assured of his competence, and he asked me not to doubt that the gentleman's wife would be like a cucumber. The girl on the bed mumbled something. The duke was immediately next to her. Being alarmed, he showed concern. Lady Lily woke up and opened her eyes. She was exhausted. The duke heard her weak voice. Tristan. The duke and his priest hung on his every word. The man realized that his wife, in a feverish delirium, was calling for her younger brother, or perhaps someone else. Lady Lily begged him not to tell her father that she had come down with a fever again. She was afraid that the younger children might suffer because of this. She placed her thin hand on his chapped hand. She called him Tristan again, and the duke asked himself whether there was a place in her life for another man. He said that he understood her and would fulfill her request. Her lips smiled, but her emerald eyes were full of sadness. The girl, exhausted, closed her eyelids and dozed off. The duke was telling the priest to get going and was going to look after the girl himself today. The priest ventured to ask how long his lordship intended to leave the lady in the dark. He replied that such a fragile girl could not bear the ugliness of his appearance. He decided that his master was clearly out of his mind, since he again started talking about his imaginary ugliness. They stood near the mirror. The priest asked His Excellency with all respect, does he at least look in the mirror? But he replied that there was no such need. The duke's face tensed and his pupils constricted. The man saw himself in the mirror as a monster, wings with feathers, a tail with scales. But only in reflection he was like that and those around him saw only his human likeness. A woman's thin hand took a cup of tea on a saucer. Lady Lily thanked the maid for her care and devotion. She asked the mistress for forgiveness that, due to her carelessness, she lost consciousness while walking in the greenhouse. The girl assured the maid that everything was fine, and it was not her fault. She wondered where her nanny was, because she hadn't seen her for a long time. She didn't mind her disappearance, but she was still curious. Lucia replied that according to rumors, the one who accompanied the lady when she arrived was put outside the door on the day the lady herself arrived. She sat under the gate and called on her mistress to forgive her. The girl could not say exactly how accurate this information was. The lady insisted that everything was fine. She decided to ask about it herself. There was a knock on the door. A male voice asked Miss for permission to enter. The man was sitting opposite at the tea table. Lily said that it was only thanks to him that she felt great. She apologized for not introducing herself to him properly. The man replied that it was not worth it, that he should have asked her forgiveness for his lack of proper manners. He said he was glad to meet you, and he introduced himself that his name was Ivan Kirchen, that he is the faithful priest of their duke. The girl said that she could only thank him for such a speedy recovery. The priest replied that it would be sad if the duke lost the head of another servant. His interlocutor was horrified that the duke could kill a servant just because she had a fever. The man asked him to believe that there was much more than one servant, and this was a great loss. After all, they were worthy and good people. Lady Lily was horrified, and then it turned out that Lucia was also in danger. The priest asserted with a sad look that only a miracle helped her escape. The girl was at a loss. She asked how it was possible to be so cruel, but the priest laughed back at her, saying that he was joking. Lily was completely at a loss, and the man laughed at his own joke that the lady was so easily led and believed him. He laughed heartily, but Lily sat with a gloomy face. She argued that it was indecent for a servant of God to stoop to such lies, even for the sake of an absurd joke. He argued that he should not be confused with the stuffy priests with bald crowns. They were part of the Conde religion, and he, with his chic hairstyle, belonged to the order of the Hickster. He asked him to be considered just a poor fellow, a priest, who followed his master from one battlefield to another. 
The lady asked if he was satisfied with everything in his life and service to Mr. Duke. After all, he still remained faithful to the Duke and God. She looked at the tea in her cup and thought, After all, according to her sources, no one is forced to become a military priest. Therefore I believed that his words should be treated with caution and divided their meaning into two. A man in holy orders addressed Miss. He claimed that before meeting her, he imagined her image a little differently than he now saw in front of him. He thought it would be good if she and the Duke succeeded in everything and supported each other. Lily asked the priest what the Duke was like in his opinion. I asked him to sincerely express his point of view. She timidly sipped her tea, holding the cup with both hands. She understood that the Duke had seen her weakness even on their wedding night, and she was afraid that if the Duke lost all desire to be near the one who could not bear a healthy child. The man thought this was impossible, and he was surprised that she still had not seen the Duke's face. She replied that even though they spent the night together, however, she doesn't even know what his appearance is. She was either blindfolded, or he was standing behind her, not allowing her to turn to face him. The priest grabbed his head. He asked her not to continue. He thought that everything was clear. He asked her to understand that the duke was too modest, and the gentleman believed that such a fragile girl could not bear the ugliness of his appearance. It looked like he simply developed a complex due to false pretense. This is how things stood according to the priest. After his frank statement, he thought a little, but then he suddenly stood up and shouted that this needed to be stopped. The surprise scared the girl a little. He claimed that he would help her if she really wanted to see his majesty's face. The room was brightly lit by the rays of the sun. The maid idolized her mistress. She claimed that if she were in the duke's place, she would immediately fall in love. After all, all the things on Lady Lily looked simply amazing. She thought the coat was meant to be as eye-catching as possible. The girl turned around at the conversation of two maids, who without hesitation in sign language, discussed her outfit and appearance. She found herself wanting to talk to them too. She decided to ask Buttercup to teach her sign language, and at that time, the girl was bringing another gorgeous dress for her to try on, and when the lady put on a robe with fur. The girl asked what Milady thought about this outfit. She replied that he was simply perfect. She had never thought before that one day she would be able to wear such luxurious things. It looked like it belonged to the Emperor's own family, and the maid claimed that Lord Isles had connections with the Imperial Palace, and it was through him that the Duke was able to get these beautiful things. She claimed that this was the minimum that the daughter of a wealthy merchant deserves. The mute maid clarified with gestures that Lord Isles was now officially a nobleman. After all, he has already opened three diamond mines. He must have been quite wealthy. Lucia interpreted sign language into words. Lily said it was great news. After all, if she had rejected this marriage, her father would never have been allowed to have connections with the Imperial Palace. Moreover, not to mention the opening of those mines, there was a huge amount of jewelry with stones on the table. Boxes, tablets, and just a scattering of women's cosmetics mixed in. There was a knock on their door. All three girls became wary, turning their attention to the doors. The priest looked into the slightly open crack. He asked my lady if she was ready. Lady Lily came out, followed by his lordship's priest. He showed her the knight's training ground. He walked clearly on the tiles, and my lady soon trotted after him, barely keeping up. She was worried about how she looked, and what I would think when I saw how she was dressed. After all, she had no reason to be in such a luxurious form. Suddenly there was a sharp sound of a shot. The lady and the priest stopped, frozen. Lily clarified whether it was the sound of a shot. She was worried that the duke might be injured. One of the knights came out to meet them, claiming that now is the height of training. I asked what made them think it would be a great idea to bring a civilian here, and a woman at that. He asked the monk if he was in his right mind to bring a sick princess here. The man was broad-shouldered. On his belt he held an impressively sized combat sword. He began to smile at my lady and asked if she was okay. He reassured her that that shot was only part of their planned training, and no one was hurt during it. The girl thought that the people in this castle cared too much about the Duchess. She said that she was relieved to accept his assurances as the truth. She asked how she could find out his name, inviting the knight to introduce himself to her. The guy was a little confused and didn't immediately know what to answer to the beautiful Lady Duchess. The knight gallantly kissed the Duchess's hand. He introduced himself by name. His name was Johannes Talon, and he offered his services to my lady. Lily remembered how on the way, on the orders of the commander, it was he who escorted her to the gates of the mansion on the first day. The guy was surprised that that incident was so deeply etched in the mistress's memory. He claimed that there were many rumors about her beauty. And now I saw with my own eyes that she is truly beautiful. And if the duke ever started a war in the name of his wife, 
he could completely understand. Talon said that when the ruler of the Eastern Empire set his sights on the granddaughter of the Marquis, then the whole country plunged into chaos. And now he fully understood the Marquis' sentiments. Lady Lily asked to stop. After all, he had already made her completely blush with embarrassment. He realized that they should change the subject, and the priest stood next to him, looking displeased. The girl widened her eyes at what she saw. The man raised the barrel and fired the gun. She clarified with Sir Talon that they needed more gunpowder. She thought she had seen this before. His lordship's priest intervened in their conversation. He was tired of standing for furniture during their conversation. He argued that such deep knowledge was to be expected from their duchess, Milady Lily. He argued that the potential of gunpowder was simply enormous, that if short-barreled weapons become widespread, then even old people and children will be able to protect themselves. The knight fired a test-blank shot into the air before their eyes. Talon waved his hand to him as a sign of gratitude for what he showed them. Talon expressed doubts about the advisability of such a distribution. After all, this could mean that the risk of shootings would increase. Lady Lily agreed that weapons were a serious topic of discussion. After all, she remembered that when her brothers were very small, even a slingshot could cause trouble. Talon was amazed at her thoughtfulness. He told my lady that her wisdom was in no way inferior to her beauty. The priest laughingly spoke to Sir Talon, and he dared to declare to him that my lady had chosen an unworthy husband. And at this time, another man was approaching from behind the priest. His gaze was unkind and his eyebrows were furrowed. The priest turned around at the sound of approaching heavy footsteps, and he began to stutter and say that they were here on an excursion. The girl looked upset. She understood that from the very beginning she was only a nuisance here. The man was taller than everyone else. He asked dryly what they were doing here. Lily asked to be forgiven for interrupting their training. She assured that she did not want to disturb them in any way. She claimed that she came here to see her husband. She had a pleading look. The girl, out of embarrassment and indecision, squeezed the hem of her chic dress with her fingers. The man looked at her with a steely, emotionless gaze. The girl continued to make excuses that they got married a few days ago, and she still hadn't seen his face. The man was silent. He turned his piercing gaze to Talon. His eyes told the knight, do something about it. He immediately read the silent order of the senior in rank. He cleared his throat and asked for my lady's forgiveness. He expressed his regrets and asked her to obey the duke's orders and leave the training ground. The priest assured that he would take responsibility for what happened, since it was his initiative to bring Lady Lily here. The girl was completely confused by what was happening between the men. She resolutely declared that she was a duchess and came here of her own free will to see her husband. She didn't want anyone to be punished for her decision. She asked in a commanding voice that the commander would really dare to disobey her order. Talon was amazed, and the priest's jaw dropped completely. Lily continued, that there is no woman in the world who will trust a husband who does not want to show her his face. She asked the commander if he agreed with her, and a few minutes earlier, in front of the duke stood two knights on the training ground. He asked them not to neglect those knights who suffered during the war, and he ordered to take care of them and their families. He said that preparations for tomorrow's expedition must go flawlessly. But then, from a distance, he saw his wife in the company of a priest, and Talon, and the gate to the site. His lily chirped flirtatiously with the knight, and he clearly sympathized with her. He asked what kind of fool could let Ivan in here. After all, he himself knew very well that the girl had been lying in bed with a high fever until yesterday. The guilty gatekeeper apologized to him, but he claimed that his lordship's priest insisted on it. The duke said that he had already forgotten and decided to figure it out himself. He hurriedly went down the steps, and his wife at this time smiled sweetly at his interlocutor. And now she was screaming at him, and she asked if he agreed with her decisive position to finally see her husband. She declared that there was no woman in the world who would trust a man who did not want to show all of himself. She argued that a husband who cannot be trusted is the worst thing you can imagine. The man listened to her, turning away. The man's gaze was fierce. The priest, seeing this, involuntarily shuddered. He gesticulated through the air so that he would say that this was the duke's order, that as soon as she returned to the castle, he would follow her. Talon asked my lady to follow him. He assured her that as soon as she returned to the castle, the duke would soon meet her there. Lady Lily agreed to agree to their terms and listen to Sir Talon. She realized that she still would not receive an answer to her questions and complaints from the captain. She asked me to tell the duke that she would no longer try to see him. Her voice was choked with disappointment at her failure. These words hit the duke like a whip in the face. His wife's harsh words hurt his feelings. Lady Lily turned around and walked away the same way she came here. Talon called out to her, catching up. He asked to be allowed to accompany her, because it was dangerous to go alone. 
The girl rushed up the stairs, picking up the hem of her dress. She thought that the Duke was angry with her that she had disobeyed his order, and yet she did not think that his game of hide-and-seek from his own wife could continue like this. She walked around the room from corner to corner, puffing with irritation. She could not understand why her husband did not want to show her his face. She was afraid that he might already hate her. She was resilient to many things. After all, she was used to this during her first marriage, and during the second, she got used to loneliness. She assumed that this time it would be the same. A male voice called her name, coming from behind. Then she heard her husband's hurried steps. The girl did not dare turn to him, so as not to violate his request. He asked Lily to forgive him. The lady replied that he was late and very late. The duke replied that he followed her as quickly as he could, but he kept his distance from her so as not to scare her. He hugged his wife tightly from behind. He claimed that he couldn't let her leave like that in a grudge against him. The man shaded her eyes with his weathered palm, and the girl realized that he would again hide his face from her. The man promised that as soon as he earned her trust, he would immediately show himself to her. The girl asked again, clarifying what it means it won't be this time. The duke promised Lily that he would spend the whole night with her if she wished. With a whistle, he turned her towards him and began to kiss her forehead. She called her husband Your Grace, but he asked her to call him by his first name. Vlad, I wanted her to call him. He suggested forgetting about their titles. After all, she called Talon by name. She turned to him. Vlad, you don't have to worry about how I address others. Besides, she only saw him at night. The girl held him by the cloak near his waist. She recalled that during all their meetings, she was always blindfolded. The duke's silent question hung in the air. The man picked her up, tearing her off the floor. He asked her to close her eyes. The duke took the girl in his arms and carried her carefully. He said that right now he would show her even more than necessary. She replied that this was not what she wanted. But now it didn't matter. His steps echoed down the corridor. Lily suggested out loud that it must be hard for him to carry her, but the man assured her that she was as light as a feather, and he laughed at her assumptions. The door creaked. The duke carried his wife in his arms into the chambers. He claimed that this room was not as luxurious as her chambers, and he admitted that this was his office, and this meant that no one except them could enter here. The doors behind them closed with a thud. The duke stopped and put the girl on her feet. He looked at the girl, and her eyes were closed. The man asked his wife why she protected Ivan. He looked at her face with interest, holding her chin with his hands. The long braid lay partly in its wave on his desk. Lily replied that she did not protect Ivan, but only wanted to find him, her husband. He bent her over to lie down on the table. He said that he understood everything that was happening around him. He claimed he knew, that it was the priest who suggested that she go out and find him to try to see him in person. The girl asked how he could know everything in the world, but he interrupted her, and he said that she herself heard what he said on the training ground. The duke leaned towards his wife. The girl thought that how could it be that she didn't see him, but he seemed so familiar to her. She suddenly opened her eyes, and in front of her was the same commander. He looked at her point blank and asked who Lily was looking for. That he's here in front of her now, he said, holding her cheek. The man addressed his wife in kind words, surprised that she could not see him with her own eyes. He held her hand, and the girl lay staring at him with her green eyes without blinking. A flash flashed in the girl's eyes. She opened her eyelids, realizing that it was just a dream. She sat in bed, covering herself with a blanket and being completely confused. Lily sat at the table and leisurely had breakfast. There were many delicious dishes laid out. Whole chicken, lobster, vegetables, fruits, herbs, sauces, drinks for every taste. The girl turned to the only maid, clarifying that she alone should really eat it all. She answered in the affirmative, adding that the duke himself ordered this. She poured tea for the girl, telling her that he was from her homeland, and it will allow her to relax a little. The lady sighed sadly. She said that this tea was sent again by her father, looking at her reflection in the cup. Once upon a time, the nanny said that the girl's father gave her a special tea, that he will be calm only when she tells him that she drank it all. The girl took the ear of the cup with trembling hands. This tea was so hard to drink. A suitcase was placed on the cabinet and its lock clicked. The doctor said that there was nothing serious, so there was no need to worry in vain. But the girl did not understand why she became so weak. The doctor apologized that he could not find the exact cause of her condition. But even though her personal maid was not there, she knew that she could not relax. The food here was simply amazing. But she will have to give up tea. The girl slid back the cup onto the saucer. Talon assured the lady that she had nothing to worry about. The girl had previously been served only by Lucia, and she was a little surprised by the sudden appearance of the duke's knight without a report. The guy assured that the duke himself chose this tea. 
He opened the box and examined the leaves before deciding on its quality. His Excellency's knight assured that all dishes served on the table were also personally checked by the Duke for the presence of poison. The maid confirmed that he tried everything before allowing him to serve. It seemed to Lily that her husband cared about her very much, even though she didn't do anything for him. She remembered that ridiculous dream. When I saw my husband's face, it turned out to be the commander of the knights. Lady Lily suddenly blushed. When the maid saw him, she became very worried about her mistress. Talon also could not understand what happened. He said he just remembered. What did they ask you to convey about the arrival of the madam's family? They arrived this morning. Lily was delighted to see her brothers arrive, but she didn't know that they were going to visit her. For her, it was a completely unexpected visit from her relatives. She suggested that they were still having a hard time without her help and support. A deep line of sadness crossed Lady Lily's face. She decided to change the topic of their conversation. She asked Talon what Vlad usually does when uninvited guests come to him. The knight became thoughtful. He wanted to choose softer words so as not to frighten or offend his mistress. After hesitating, he still had to answer that he, in principle, did not treat guests very well, whether invited or not. A man of enormous stature, strong and broad in the shoulders, categorically refused to fulfill the request. He argued that if his lordship had not given permission, the answer was no. He told Sir Talon this, because how could he not know himself? A bandage covered his damaged eye, and hair covered most of his face. The knight claimed that the duchess herself came out to greet her family, and he once again asked the thug to open the gate for them. He mockingly claimed that the duchess was just a commoner who had managed to marry a nobleman. He looked at the procession. A carriage drawn by four horses slowly drove up to the gate. He thought that the duke's wife must now be trying to sneak her entire family into the castle in order to get the duke out of there. The air crackled with the growing tension between the men. Talon shouted at the gatekeeper that the duchess was waiting at the carriage and he was obliged to open the gate. That he is disrespecting my lady. That they all swore allegiance to her. But the big man didn't want to listen to him. He claimed that the lady arrived to them three months earlier than expected. And this brought them a lot of problems. At this time... The carriage swayed and Lady Lily came out. Both men waited for further developments with the fate of the Duchess, and the girl was like the most tender heavenly creature. Standing between his lordship's two knights, she seemed even more fragile. She greeted Count Walcus with joy. He bent down on one knee, acknowledging her superiority. He said he was honored. He introduced himself according to all his titles, offering his services. The Count glanced at the lady briefly. He told himself that even though she was lovely, it didn't change the fact that her family showed up unannounced. He promised himself to still remain on the alert. He convinced himself that it was better to be hated for his integrity than for his lack of confidence, continuing to kneel before the Duchess. The girl turned into a thug. The man was sure that she would start screaming at him, but she calmly asserted that she appreciated his genuine concern for the safety of his master and cat is as a whole. He looked at her tender features and was touched by her tenderness. He admitted that there was much more greatness in the girl than he had originally imagined. Lady Lily asked his forgiveness that her arrival had led to an argument. Count Valkus coughed in response. The girl claimed that she came here to send her family home. The gatekeeper was surprised to hear this. She argued that disrespecting the Duchess in front of her master's man was not the wisest way to prove his loyalty. The Count chuckled. He claimed that he understood everything. That the Duchess came here to send her relatives out, not to let them in. Lily confirmed the correctness of his guesses. She assured that she respects the Duke and his preferences, and she invited the Count to open the gate for her and let her carriage through. The thug bowed to the girl. He asked my lady's forgiveness for the disrespect shown. He shouted at the armored guards to move to obey her ladyship's orders. Lily breathed a sigh of relief. Talon looked at his mistress with delight. He was surprised by her determination and tact in dealing with the rude lout at the gate. He smiled, glad that the dispute was resolved in their favor. A blonde guy was hurrying towards the girl. He waved his hand and called Lily. The Duchess was glad to see Brother Dandelion. She hurried to meet him. The brother jumped and galloped his way to his sister in order to embrace her in his strong embrace. He told her that he missed her a lot. The girl asked if everything was okay with him. She wondered where their brother Lockie was. He replied that he had been a little busy lately, and instead of him, he took Tristan as his traveling companion. The man stepped off the carriage and it swayed a little. The brother and sister were both ash blonde with green eyes and looked very similar to each other. They waited until the third one joined them. Tristan was tall and strong in the shoulders. His brown hair fell in curls over his face. Sharp facial features with expressive gray eyes showed him to be a man of character. He reached out to kiss her hand. 
and he said that it was a great joy for him to meet the Duchess of Winter, gallantly kissing her hand. Lily said that she had not seen him for a long time. The man turned away. He said her dress looked beautiful, and he made the assumption that her husband treated her well. In response, the girl only rustled the hem of her dress, demonstrating its splendor. She confirmed his suspicions. Even though she only recently arrived here, she claimed that she had already managed to settle down here. My brother was glad to hear this, but for some unknown reason he suddenly shuddered, and he fearfully told how on the way here, through the carriage window, he saw a severed head hanging under the bridge. Dandelion then thought that this place was simply terrifying, and he asked the coachman to speed up the horses with his whip. The brother turned around, pointing his gaze at Talon. He said that he had the impression that that knight would cut off his head if for his reason the girl shed even one tear. His lordship's knight stood at a distance from the duchess and her brothers. His gaze was icy. The girl told her brother that such things should not be said, and Tristana asked my lady why don't they continue their conversation inside. She answered him, sighing, that she was glad that they had come such a long way to see her, but she asked her to understand that she could not invite them to the castle. She stopped the hand that wanted to caress her. Lady Lily asked them to return when they received permission from the duke to stay in his mansion. She explained that they needed permission to enter Cadiz, but she said that the duke was now on an expedition, so she has no way to contact him. Tristan was surprised that the main woman in this castle really doesn't have the authority to invite her family or friends to visit her. The man was annoyed that the duke was such a person. The brunette was sitting on the first bench, closest to the altar. A lady in white robes came out to meet him. She asked why he was the only one who came to the base of his knights. The brunette squinted his steel-colored eyes, answering that they were chasing monsters. His interlocutor, as always, invariably smiled. Her gray hair fell over her shoulders and her dry arms were hidden under her wide sleeves. The duke explained that the war was over, so the number of pure fighters was decreasing, and his people, who had recently shared the battlefield with him, now dared to brazenly flirt with his wife. The woman chuckled. She said that the duke spent more than ten years on the battlefield with his men, and the fact that his wife had a nice conversation with his subordinate is surprising what became such a serious problem for him. The duke asked if this was bad. The long liver said that she would never have thought that he could get angry for such a reason, and she assumed that these were the advantages of a long life. The duke stood up and was about to leave. He said that he saw her in a good mood, and he briefly said goodbye to her. She spoke after the departing person. That books written in Braille are a wonderful thing, and thanks to his lordship, the children are doing great too. Vlad narrowed his eyes. He understood the woman's words in his own way. This meant that the princess was still alive. The gates swayed. The knight opened them wide and entered. The duke asked what brought him here. The man explained using sign language that a request was received regarding permission to travel to the castle territory. Vlad suggested that it could be the imperial family, and while the princess's head remained untouched, he asked him to tell them to get out, if they don't want to start a war with him. But the speaker stopped the duke, who was about to leave. He clarified that the Isles family had arrived. The duke was lost in thought. He continued that the duchess's brothers arrived without warning. Therefore his lordship asked how best they should deal with those who had arrived. Vlad left everything to his wife's discretion. Carriages and carts with cargo waited in line to be allowed through the gate. Tristan asked the girl if her new husband was treating her well. They walked along the park path and had a pleasant conversation about various news. The girl replied that with her husband she appreciated his tolerance and care. But she claimed that there was still a lot she didn't know. But this little thing she has now still brings her relief. The man muttered something under his breath. There was a pause in their conversation. Lily asked Tristan what was bothering him so much. She held him by the edge of his jacket and he turned back. But he assured the girl that he just seemed to be worrying about her in vain. Tulips grew thickly in the flower bed. Just at this time there was active flowering. The man claimed that these flowers reminded him of when they were younger. And she cried for the only time then. The girl sat on the bed and sobbed. The man was next to her. She was in tears and told Tristan that she didn't want to get married, that she couldn't bear to be separated from them. And then he was thoughtful. After all, he couldn't influence it in any way. The man grabbed her hand and placed a tulip flower in her palm. He promised her that one day he could become rich, and then he was going to give her a much more luxurious bouquet of flowers. The man smiled and was determined to change his life and his girls for the better. He said that he considered it better to marry a friend than someone whose face he had never seen, referring to himself as her husband. The girl sincerely laughed at his childish reasoning. She asked Tristan how he was sure that she would want to marry him. Lady Lily laughed. 
She couldn't believe that Tristan still remembered this all that time, carrying the moment of their revelation in his memory. The man continued to joke. He said that since then his face has hardly become more handsome. The girl could tell him one thing for sure, that he was still able to make her laugh. Tristan remained serious, and the girl was amazed. She was hit as if by a whip. He brought his face closer to hers. I asked what she thought. Is he cuter than her current husband? Lady Lily hesitated a bit with her answer. She replied that her husband was quite ordinary, but her husband's appearance was not important to her. The girl looked away, and for some time she was sad and thoughtfully silent. Tristan saw that the girl was not saying something, trying to hide something about him that worried her greatly, and he said that he sees her lies. Her eyes widened. The man carefully began to ask her, has she really not seen her husband's face yet? The setting sun painted the sky and the castle in scarlet and purple tones. There was the sound of footsteps on the paved path. Vlad stood holding his horse by the bridle. He watched his wife through the window. He was satisfied with what he saw. Lady Lily walked nervously from corner to corner, not knowing what she should do. She had a bandage in her right hand and a candle in her left. She doubted whether this decision would really be the right one. She recalled Tristan's advice to disobey her husband. What when will the Duke realize that she doesn't care about his appearance? Then they will be able to resolve all other misunderstandings between themselves. Lily clutched the bandage in her hand. She decided that she would no longer have to close her eyes in the presence of her husband. She was on her knees and hiding a candle under the bed, just to catch a glimpse of your spouse's face while he sleeps. The girl sat on the edge of the bed and waited. She should never have gotten caught, and for this she needed to behave as usual. Her husband was due to arrive shortly. She began to tie the blindfold over her eyes. The man entered. He watched the girl from afar. He praised her for her humility and beauty, and he laughed heartily, looking forward to spending time with her. The girl called him. She asked his lordship for forgiveness, and she assured that she could not tie the bandage properly. The man approached her. He reminded her that for her he is just Vlad. Meanwhile, he helped with tying a strong knot of ribbon at the back of her head. Her heart began to beat faster. She was surprised that the sound of the heartbeat was hers, and she couldn't understand why she became so nervous. The duke assured that everything was ready with the bandage and played with her blonde strands of hair. The girl excitedly asked if he was injured. After all, she had heard that during the expedition they always encountered monsters. The man's face was tense. He knelt next to the hem of her skirt. I was surprised that this was exactly what she was worried about while she was here alone. The girl timidly insisted that this was so. After all, she was his wife. The duke knelt before her and held her hands. He said that on their first night, he believed that her worries were nothing more than groundless fears. He gently touched her fingers. Lily touched his cheek. She asked what had changed now. He replied that now this feature of her seemed sweet to him in its own way. The girl was lying on the bed, covered with a blanket. On the other side of the bed, a man was sleeping with his head turned away. She opened her eyes and listened to her husband's breathing. It was clear from everything that he was already fast asleep. She thought that this was the first time she had seen his sleeping silhouette. Her husband always left before she woke up in the morning. The duke heard his wife get out of bed. He opened his eyes, listening to her further actions. The girl began to look under the bed for the candlestick that she had been preparing in the evening, feeling for its location there. She told herself that she would only look at his face for a second, and at that very moment she would put out the candle flame. Her eyes brightened when she found the candle. Lily just thought that now she needed some light. As Vlad also stood up, his eyes flashed with the red glow of a hungry beast. The girl shuddered. He immediately covered her eyes with his palm. The candle fell from her hands onto the blanket. She called him by name. The duke quickly pushed her onto her back and straddled her on top, taking the leading position. He said that it seemed his wife was ready to face the consequences of her actions. His eyes looked like red coals in the darkness. The girl's heart beat rapidly in her chest. He still kept his hand on her eyelids. He asked if she was ready to look at him. The man removed his hand from her eyelids. He argued that if she was willing to pay for this, she should know. His eyes glowed with lights in the darkness. That as soon as she sees the true him. Then her marriage will become much worse than it was in complete ignorance. The girl did not open her eyelids. She said she was very scared. She was more than sure that Vlad was in front of her. But at the same time, it's as if he's not him at all. He looked down at her. The girl said that she wanted to prove that his appearance did not bother her at all. The duke wiped away a tear that had come through the girl's closed eyelids. He was sure that it was her brothers who forced her to prove something, either to him or to them. Lily claimed that it was her wish too. The duke realized its logic and correctness. He said that meant their marriage was no different. He understood that it was difficult for her to confront her loved ones. Therefore, 
she reluctantly decided to marry him, and those caresses and her experiences were only a distraction. He reproached that he expected something more from his wife, whom he himself did not trust. The Duke was well aware that Lily was forced to marry him, therefore he was very upset. Having wished his wife good night, he decided to leave her alone to rest until the morning. The man left the room. His wife screamed and asked him to stop, but he didn't even turn around and the door closed behind him with a thud. Lily was left alone in the bedroom. She sat on the bed, partially covered with a blanket, thinking about her husband. The three maids walked along the corridor. One said that her ladyship was simply amazing. She was amazed how she managed to adapt to so many servants so quickly. The other one was not at all surprised. After all, the Lady Duchess was the daughter of Lord Isles. It was nothing new for her to interact with hired people. But the first one believed that Lady Lily's merits were still difficult to overestimate, and she understood why everyone liked her so much. A man was spying on them. It was Tristan. The girls moved away. One of them said that she had heard about the things that the lady received from the Imperial family. The man took a hesitant step. Mentally, he asked Lily for forgiveness, but he was going to go against his conscience. It was already morning. The sun's rays brightly illuminated the room. The girl was still in her nightwear, rubbing her sleepy eyes. She thought that for some reason she could not sleep a wink. An envelope with a message was waiting for her on the table. She was a little surprised to see him here. Lily opened the letter and began to quickly read its contents. Her eyes widened at his content. Dearest Lily, I'm afraid that I won't be in the castle today due to important matters. Please don't wait for me in the evening. I probably won't be back until nightfall. I'll leave Talon with you. You can give him orders. The Duke walked between the rows of shops. He sat down on the front of them and folded his hands in prayer. The man sat deep in thought for some time. A man's hand plucked leaves from a branch. He decided whether or not to wake the girl, and the twig with leaves was like a daisy for making decisions. The man could wait no longer. He pushed the door to the lady's room and wished her good morning. The girl looked up from the paper with her husband's message. Lily put the letter back in the envelope, called Talon to come through. Yvonne sat in a waddle. He had difficulty putting on his shirt and had a bandage on his injured shoulder. He advised the interlocutor to tell his wife everything and finally ease his soul. The Duke replied that his advice was absurd. He wanted an optimal solution, not an empty answer. Ivan admitted that he was risking his life by telling his lordship about this, but he believed that his wife might ask for a divorce. Vlad held his temples from their excessive pulsation. He narrowed his eyes, realizing the priest's insolence. Ivan was already buttoning his shirt. He asked to give the girl a chance to see her husband's face, since she was so striving for it. The duke grabbed Ivan by the shirt and began to threaten him with his eyes, but he admitted that the girl was already thinking about their separation. The clergyman flew towards the wall and hurt himself painfully against it. Afterwards, he rubbed the back of his head with his hand and complained that it hurt him so much. The duke came closer to Ivan. He claimed that it was not in vain that he was sent on that expedition, and if he even once dares to talk about his wife like that, he sharply hit the wall next to his head with his hand. The man promised that people would admire Ivan's head, suspended from the ceiling of the castle. For greater clarity, tapping your finger with your finger. Vlad turned around at the sound of approaching steps. Lily approached the men, concerned for both of them. Ivan stammered and asked my lady what brought her here. The girl was scared and pressed her hand to her lips. She assured that she was going to go to confession. Her maid, Lucia, seeing the picture, became completely overwhelmed. She thought to herself that all handsome men were either already married or in love with each other. The lady was confused. She claimed that she didn't even realize that the commander and father Ivan, but he didn't let her finish. He claimed that the lady had misunderstood everything. The girl replied that she respected their preferences, and with that she promised to leave them alone, making the sweetest and most innocent grimace. Lily picked up the hem of her dress and ran away. Father Ivan shouted the most untranslatable words after her. He asked my lady to wait, after all, his interlocutor had something to tell her. The gate swung open and the girl flew away like an arrow. Then she tried to comprehend what she had recently seen. It looked like those men loved each other. Soon the brunette caught up with her. He shouted after her to wait for him, addressing her as Dearest Lily. The girl was surprised by such treatment from the captain of the knights. She paused. Lily turned around at the sound of a man's voice. Her eyes were wide open, and the man blamed Ivan for everything. The woman's shoes clicked as the girl approached the man. She asked the commander if she could ask him a question. He turned his head to the side so as not to look into her eyes, and he hesitated in indecision with the answer. Lady Lily tugged at his cloak. She claimed that if he did not want to talk to her, then they could communicate using sign language. The girl duplicated what was said with hand gestures, but the man continued to stand in front of her silently. 
Lily claimed that she was just studying while gesticulating. Therefore, I asked her to forgive me if sometimes she began to speak. The man answered with his fingers that he understood her. She asked if he had accidentally left a letter in her chambers. The man's eyes flashed. The girl expressed the assumption that he was Vlad. The man froze without giving her an answer. Lily remembered the postscript in that letter in the afterword. The husband wrote that if she meets the commander, then she should not be afraid or afraid of him. She was then surprised by such a special attitude towards her subordinate. She also remembered that he had asked her earlier why she was protecting Ivan. That just one conversation with the military priest made her husband so jealous. And now the jealous Vlad asked his wife to trust the man with whom she, although she sometimes crossed paths, knew very little. Lady Lily thought for a moment. She crossed paths with him for the first time when they were attacked by a monster along the way. Then when Vlad caught up with her from the training ground, he called his wife Lily. But he hugged her from behind so that she could not see his face. And now the commander's voice and his unique and significantly different from the other's address made the girl think. Lily looked at the man intently and appraisingly. She couldn't be wrong. It was definitely the voice of her husband. The girl spoke, watching his reaction. Is it possible that he is her husband, Duke Vlad? The man froze. Her heart was beating wildly, although he knew how to control himself like no one else. He didn't know where to start, and how to explain to a girl. But Lily had already apologized to the commander. She said she just found out he was married. And therefore, the way he just called out to her. She could simply have heard it. She asked for forgiveness, and said that she felt like a complete idiot. The man thought that, of course, Lily was unlikely to believe that a man with such a face could be her husband. The girl asked if he could accompany her to the castle, that Sir Talon promised to wait for her nearby. But now she doesn't see him anywhere. The man walked with the girl next to him. She looked at him unobtrusively. She told herself that she would have to pretend that she didn't know anything until he told her everything. But she also knew that they definitely had a lot to talk about. The wind was blowing, shaking the tree branches. The girl shivered. She said that she forgot her coat at Sir Talon's, that it was worth listening to him and not taking off your outerwear in church. The man, without further ado, threw his clothes over her shoulders. Lily thanked him for his concern. She voiced the assumption that this was such an order from the Duke. She made eyes at him. The girl walked accompanied by a man right under the mansion building. She turned her attention to the snowman. She sat down next to the snowy figure. She said that she often sculpted these with her brothers when she was a child. She looked at the snowman with emotion. Lily touched the leaf on the head of the snowy figure. She said that he was so cute and such a charm. But then the unexpected happened. Part of the snowman's face fell off. The girl did not know that the twig would fall off. The man handed her a twig which he picked up next to the figurine. He stood next to the snowman and the girl, leaning on one knee. Lily asked the commander not to tell her that it was he who made that snowman. The girl laughed. She asked her to forgive her. But it would be difficult for her to imagine such a thing. The man's gaze betrayed his emotions. Lady Lily has already returned the missing part of the figurine to its place. She asked the man to evaluate her improvements. After all, now the snowman was smiling. She promised to keep their games with the snowman a secret. After all, if the duke finds out, he won't be happy about it. The man began to write something on the snow untouched by human footprints. Lily turned her full attention to that. A question was written about what my lady's thoughts were. The girl took the wand from his hands. She somehow never thought that they could communicate in this way. Lily began to write in the same way in the fresh snow. If you are brave, everything will come, the man read in the snow. The duke thought that his courage had never been questioned, and it looked like he couldn't win against Lily. But he smiled at his wife's resourcefulness. The girl said that when they meet again, she will say this phrase to him using sign language. And she promised to try hard to get lessons from Lucia. She said that since she trusted him, she asked him to trust her back. The man's heart was ready to jump out of his chest. The same thing happened with Lily. The man said that not being afraid of him did not mean that you had to look at him with such a sweet look. He rose from his knees and stood at his full enormous height next to the girl. The moon with a horned cow illuminated the sky above the castle. The girl was accompanied by a man, and Lily seems to be a little cold. The man ordered a hot bath to be prepared for her. Lily said, Vlad, my hand, and put her cold palm in his hand. He was surprised that she was so cold. The man offered his other hand. He said that she must also want to warm her other hand. The servants were all astonished by what they saw. They had round eyes and slack jaws. Lady Lily suggested they talk inside the mansion, and the maids gasped after them with joy for their masters. Lucia caring for her mistress's hair. She said that she didn't even know that the Duke had such a side of his character. What the girl can't even imagine is how surprised everyone was at what they saw. 
She claimed that it was thanks to the emotions of affection and love of the masters that the atmosphere in the castle was so lively. Lily answered Dandelion sincerely that she also likes living here, and this was thanks to a faithful and caring maid. The girl was a little alarmed by Lucia's phrase about family. After all, she saw her brother outside the castle. She was asking if Dandelion had done anything wrong. The maid clarified that if the mistress is talking about a man with a ponytail, then not at all, that he didn't do anything wrong. I just asked a few questions. For example, how many servants are there in the palace? How much do girls earn? Do they like working here? And all that stuff. Lily replied that it was probably Tristan, but she wondered what he could have forgotten in the servants' quarters. There was a slight pause in the conversation. Lucia hesitated a little. She began to say the rest into the mistress's ear with a most serious face. Lily was horrified by what she heard from the maid, and she decided for herself that she needed to see Tristan at all costs. The men were unloading barrels from a huge cart. Tristan stood with a sheet of paper, checking the goods he had received. Lady Lily called him by name. He was a little surprised by her coming to such a place. The girl joyfully ran towards him. She clarified whether it was cargo from the capital, and she claimed that she could take everything from here herself. After all, it was her duty as the main lady of the family. She asked her to forgive her. The man put the list behind his back. He argued that it might be difficult for her, and he promised that he would do everything himself, guaranteed the safety of all items during transportation. The girl was in earnest. She said that even if this was so, then she... The man interrupted her. He suggested they talk inside. They left the movers to deal with the barrels, and they themselves went into the castle and drank tea. Lily said he wasn't acting like his usual self today. She took a sip of tea and put the cup on the saucer. The man retorted, answering that he did not feel that anything in him had suddenly changed. The girl said sympathetically that it seemed to her as if he was in pain. She asked what was bothering him so much, which could be putting too much pressure on yourself. The man replied that lately, to be honest, he couldn't sleep at all, and all because he is very worried about her. The girl interrupted him. She claimed that she had something to tell him. He asked if she had seen her husband's face. The girl answered in the affirmative, remembering a moment from the past day. So she believed that her father no longer had any reason to worry. She argued that in any case, there was a more important topic for their conversation. Tristan, hearing the icy notes in the girl's voice, narrowed his eyes. After all, my father once spoke, reasoning that his daughter is no different from the others, and thus Lily is the same as all the courtesans Tristan has been with before. And he asked the man to make sure that the girl did not become pregnant before his return, with hope, entrusting him with a difficult task. Tristan asked Lily not to tell him that she had already entered the servants' quarters. The man was angry and angry. The man held the handrail of the guest chair tightly with his hand. He asked that if she heard everything, then... The girl interrupted him without allowing him to finish. She reminded him that he was here as her guest and she convincingly asked him to respect the people living here. Tristan couldn't stand it. He lost his nerve. He placed his hands on the table with a crash. He convinced her that she was very naive, and he doesn't know what's going on here, and she has no idea what her husband really thinks about her. He walked around the table, coming closer to the girl, claimed that her husband simply added it to his collection, and when he came to the servants, he was convinced of just this. The girl didn't understand what he was getting at. Tristan continued the thought, playing with a strand of her hair, that her husband had until recently hidden his face from her, and he asked if she thought it was strange. A few minutes ago, Duke Vlad was walking down the corridor with a box in his hands. The knight bowed to him when he met. I welcome the gentleman back. The man asked where Lily was. Talon replied that the lady inside was talking with her friend. Vlad was surprised. He opened the door and stepped onto the threshold. Through the open door, he saw a man bending over his wife. The box fell from his hands, and the duke's gaze did not promise anything good. He saw the other one whispering something in Lily's ear. Tristan told the girl that her husband simply took her into his collection, because she is a cursed woman who brings only death to her husbands, and that all those who live in this castle were also abandoned by this world, like herself. What if the duke truly considered her a worthy wife? Then he would never in his life allow these disabled people to serve her. Therefore, he considered it just another item in his collection, just another messed up person, the girl became sad realizing the rationality of his words. She put Tristan some distance away from her, and she said that she herself knows. This surprised the man very much. The girl continued that perhaps he was right, that she was really cursed. Still, she thought she was living a good enough life for who she really was. She clutched the hem of her dress. She answered forcefully that she appreciated his concern. But she asked Tristan not to remind her again that he looked at her that way. The man knelt in front of Lily. He asked her to understand that this was not what he wanted to convey to her. 
that it is not he who needs to be blamed, but the person in whose veins the blood of the monster flows. Vlad came closer, but no one noticed him yet. The girl replied that it did not matter to her whether her husband was a demon, an animal, or a monster. But from her point of view, he was better than him, Tristan. She asked Tristan to apologize to the Duke. The girl saw her husband waiting not far away, but her interlocutor did not take this into account. He claimed that she seemed to enjoy feeling like a duchess. He grinned in her face, and he asked, holding her shoulder, how long her happiness would last. He asked mockingly, does she really think that the Duke will not get tired of her and will not find another woman to entertain his perverted soul? Vlad silently approached them from behind. Tristan reminded that she had already been married three times, but he was the one who calmed her down every time. He asked if her husband knew about this. He reminded her how afraid she was to marry the Duke. Tristan turned around, only now noticing the presence of a third person. But he didn't show it. Lily was confused. There were tears in her eyes. But Vlad grabbed Tristan's hand, which was so inappropriately lying on his wife's shoulder. The Duke's eyes glowed with an evil red light. He argued that for a sane person, it does not matter who is in front of him. A duchess, a commoner, a family member, or just a friend. He believed that in any case, it was unacceptable to force anyone in this way. Tristan fell to his knees in front of Lily. From under his forehead he looked warily at the Duke, and he asked if he was afraid of the monster's presence, sparkling with its red lights. Then Talon approached, accompanied by two knights. The Duke ordered the man to be taken to the dungeon. He obeyed the master's order. The man was lifted by the arm of a knight. Duke Vlad accused Tristan of attacking the leading lady of the house, and also enforcing servants into prostitution. Lily began to shout at Tristan, so that he would confirm to her face that her husband was telling the truth. Tristan was led away by the arms of two of his lordship's knights. He appealed to Lily, so that she would not be stupid and not trust the false words of her husband. The girl looked after the man with tears in her eyes, and the duke was furious and his eyes sparkled with red lights. Lily told her husband that she was extremely sorry. She admitted that she had suspicions about Tristan earlier. But I couldn't even think that he would come to this. Vlad was not angry with his wife. He thought she should take a good rest today. And he advised us to take Buttercup for company. He hugged Lily tenderly, holding her head from his chest. He said that they would discuss everything with her later, when she calmed down a little. The girl asked how she felt and if she was okay after the events. She looked into his eyes with concern. But he assured her that he was fine, holding her by the neck and looking into her eyes. He said that he seemed to understand why she defended him to her friend. He told his Lily that she played the role of his wife perfectly, so don't worry about him. He pulled away from her embrace, saying goodbye. The Duke claimed that it was still cool today. He advised her to rest and stay warm. He quickly walked out of the room. Lady Lily was already surrounded by maids. She called out her departing husband by name, but he left the room without looking back at her call. The girl was left alone with her mental anxieties. The knights stood under the front doors. Talon mentally addressed his lordship, and he believed that rather than increase the number of guards, it would be worth reconciling with Milady. Lucia asked Sir Talon what they should do in this case. She was carrying a tray of tea and salad to her mistress. The girl voiced her fear that at this rate the mistress was not far from fainting. The knight asked my lady permission to enter, introducing himself. The girl was still in bed, she had not gotten up yet. Talon asked if she would like to walk along the corridor with him, and the bright but cold winter sun was shining through the window. Lady Lily walked along the red carpet of the castle, accompanied by a knight. She sighed a little. Talon asked her what was bothering her so much, but she only sighed again in response. Lily decided to be frank with the knight. She said with a sad face that her worries concerned Vlad, that she just doesn't know what to do with him. After all, her husband has been avoiding her for several days and nights, and this at a time when she no longer needs to close her eyes in his presence. And he doesn't try to hide his face. He simply leaves without explanation from the room where she appears, doesn't respond to her call, ignoring it as best he can. And it seemed to her now that he had built a wall between them. Talon replied that he was not able to comment or advise anything to the lady, since the duke remained a mystery even to them. But he knew one thing for sure. Lily perked her ears, ready to catch his every word. The duke disregards the conventions imposed by society. But it was in a good sense of the word. The knight told the girl that in Arcadia, people who induce girls into prostitution are executed, and usually the duke himself personally cuts off the head and then hangs it on the wall. But her friend, for the first time, will simply be put in prison under guard. Lily believed that Tristan did not want to involve the maids in this, and she was sure that her father sent him as a replacement nanny. She turned to the knight, so that he would help her and take her to Vlad now. 
The Duke at this time was sitting behind business papers with a peacock pen and working. He answered the girl briefly, No way. The girl did not back down. She persuaded him that she was not asking him to forgive him. She assured that Tristan occupied an important position in the Merchants Guild, and they can use this by demanding a hefty ransom. Vlad began to quickly write something on paper. He said that first he would like to receive a ransom in the form of jewelry, Lily asked, not understanding why she needed to take this into account. Vlad accused his wife that she did not have the courage to say that she wanted to save him. That she called Tristan in a feverish delirium when she was sick. What did he tell her then? That she got married three times, and he reassured her every time. Vlad concluded from all this that, apparently, they were connected by a long history. He grabbed his head, and he admitted that in a fit of jealousy, he resorted to dirty tricks, thus becoming no better than that person. Lily was offended that apparently her visit was pointless. Vlad was simply horrified. She continued, apologizing for interrupting him while he was working, and she pointedly turned around and walked away from the Duke's office. The girl was deep in thought. She expected her husband to react differently, but he asked Lily to wait and not leave. He got up from the table in the hope of catching up with her as she left. Having caught up with her, he confessed that he felt like he was becoming a fool, and it was all because of her. The paper with the pen remained lying on the table. There were inscriptions crossed out and written again. The man hugged his wife from behind. He spoke into her ear, that he does not consider what is happening to him as something bad. However, the man she calls her friend. He asked not to call him in such a sweet tone. After all, she is his wife, after all. And I couldn't immediately start calling him by name. But the girl assured Vlad that this was due to the fact that she still does not quite know who he is. She looked into his eyes, and she claimed that she would like to know more about him. The man took the girl's brush in his hand. He asked if she would like to know more about us, and he began to kiss her hand. The Duke brought his face closer to his wife. He said that if this was her desire, then he would be happy to tell her everything she wanted about himself. The office was empty. The Duke passionately kissed his wife on the lips. She asked him to stop and argued that this was impossible. After all, someone could come here at any moment. Vlad claimed that this was not the worst thing they had done in this room. He locked the door. At the same time, he asked that maybe she was asking him to open the door. The girl refused his proposals and asked to clarify what he meant. She couldn't remember them doing anything here. The Duke said that she would not remember, because today was the first time she saw this room. The girl started to stutter something to answer him. She clarified that it was in her dream, and it turned out that everything happened in this room, and if so, then all responsibility now lies with him. The man replied that this time it would not be possible to blame everything on him alone. He locked the door and began to hug his wife. The dim light of the night penetrated through the bars into the cell. Tristan sat on the bunk and talked about what the Duke looked like, and it was not surprising that Lily fell in love with such a handsome man. Dandelion maintained a conversation through the bars with the prisoner. Tristan hissed in anger. He asked the guy to repeat what he had just told him. The young man asked to watch his tone. He claimed that this is not how they communicate with visitors. Dandelion claimed that this duke was a level above all the previous bastards his sister had married, that he is handsome and good-looking, and it is unlikely that anywhere else one could find a man as noble as the duke. The knights gossiped behind Vlad's back. One claimed that he understood that his gaze was naturally piercing, but now it's becoming completely unbearable. Another claimed that it was because a pimp had come in the carriage with the Isles family. Dandelion argued that if he were in Lily's place, Vlad, who suddenly approached, asked the guy if he wanted to join his comrade. The guy turned his head to his lordship in fear. The duke asked the knights to leave them alone with the prisoner. They obediently left, bowing to him and taking the guy with them. Dandelion wondered how much of their conversation the duke had heard. Vlad stood in the cell in front of the prisoner. He claimed that it turns out he was playing with his wife. Tristan grinned, expressing my opinion that this is not the most appropriate language for a duke. The prisoner claimed that he had no idea how he managed to charm Lily, but he assured him that he was in the same position, so he was willing to see who she would end up really trusting, but Vlad claimed that he did not yet know the answer. Tristan claimed that he knew in advance, that it was because of her family that Lily suffered all her life. In addition, she believed that she was to blame for the death of her mother, and no one in the world can convince her, even herself. Dandelion walked away with clenched fists, hearing snippets of conversation. The prisoner claimed that this is why he became a source of comfort for the girl, those who could be relied on in any situation. Tristan claimed that the Duke had now taken this comfort away from Lily, but the Duke answered coldly that it was he himself who deprived her of comfort and made her suffer, that he had heard rumors that he had made his way to the top of the trade guild, 
and that he did all this because he loved Lily. But the girl never looked at him, and she always turned away, leaving with the other on the arm. The man was taken aback by the Duke's revelation. The Duke claimed that when one of his plans did not work, they ended up threatening his wife. He asked the prisoner how he differed from the girl's father, Shylock Isles. Tristan yelled back, asking the Duke how he was different from them then. That Vlad only wanted a wife with a pretty face who would obey him. The Duke's hand rested on his sword. His blade was immediately pointed at the prisoner's throat, by the hand of his grace the Duke. He argued that if it had been so, he would have lost his head on his shoulders long ago. Tristan looked into the Duke's eyes with steely composure, and he used a blade to make a small incision on the man's skin. He said that he was kept alive not only through the mercy shown. Vlad told him to listen carefully. He promised to explain to him why they were different. His eyes again burned with red lights, that for the sake of Lily, he was ready to start a war. And if she wishes, he will be more than happy to bow down to her and become her trophy. The Duke advised Tristan to go down to Earth. The Duke swore with his own hands to return everything that had been taken from Lily. The Knight told my lady what the Master told her, that he still has a lot to do today, and he offered to take her to the bedroom if she was already tired. But she replied that she would wait for him a little longer. Lady Lily was rereading the business papers on Duke Vlad's desk. She wanted to delve a little into his business. The girl could not believe that everything donated by the Emperor was destroyed. She couldn't understand why she would throw away such expensive things. But apparently the Duke did not lack funds, nor did he have problems with the law. She understood that it was not easy to take care of all her subjects. It could be said that he looked after the place very well. Vlad was a good owner and a good husband. Lady Lily continued to read various business papers from her husband's desk, discovering more and more new aspects of his activity and personality. One book fell into her hands. There were various entries about monsters. She found something that interested her. Between the pages of the book, Lily found two silver scales. But then a noise caught her attention. Her brother burst into the office, and Talon grabbed him by the arm. Dandelion called his sister, and he struggled from the knight's grip, demanding to be allowed in. Lady Lily quite calmly asked Talon what happened. She closed the book that interested her so much. The guy finally broke free from the knight's grip. He asked the lady for forgiveness, said her brother was very stubborn, and I wanted to tell her something. And the guy ran towards his sister. He said that he learned everything from Tristan, that she always got married only because of them. He asked her to forgive him. The girl asked Dandelion why he suddenly started talking about it. He replied that Tristan told him that he and the Duke had a fight in prison. The guy's eyes sparkled, full of tears from emotion. He continued the story that then the Duke took out a sword, and Tristan. The guy didn't finish. Lily shook his shoulders to keep him quiet. She thought with resentment that since Vlad himself used the sword, she should have intervened in this. Something irreparable could happen. The girl ran as fast as she could and called Tristan, although he could not hear her. She burst into the prisoner's cell and asked Vlad not to do what he had planned out of emotion. Lady Lily asked the Duke to have mercy on the man. He asked if she had any feelings for this man. The Duke threw the sword at her feet. Indignantly, he claimed that this was why the Grand Duchess asked him for Tristan. Vlad glanced sideways at his wife. She looked at him with pleading eyes. He realized that he had neither the right nor the courage to demand an answer from Lily. But one way or another, begging for mercy of another man in front of him, his husband, was risky. He turned away from them, voicing this thought of his. The Duke left the cell. Lady Lily ran, catching up with him. She asked to do this not for Tristan's sake, but for her own sake. Vlad looked back at his wife. Tristan was also surprised. Lily convinced him that he didn't know how painful it was to sit quietly and wait for someone else's decision. She claimed that this time she wanted to handle the situation herself. After all, she believed that she herself was responsible for letting Tristan in. The Duke was a little surprised by her attitude. He remembered her words that Tristan occupied a high position in the trade guild and that she offered to demand a large ransom for him. Then he asked why he should do this. Lady Lily suggested discussing whether there were any casualties and how can you apologize. The man's gaze was scary. The girl couldn't stand it and lowered her eyes to the floor. She claimed that it was better when she didn't see his face. Then she could not cross paths with him, and I didn't know what kind of person he was. But now, even though she could stand opposite him like this, it seemed to her that there was a huge gap between them. She believed that she no longer wanted to live like this. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. Vlad was amazed by her reaction. The girl, seeing his confusion, continued to cry. But he hugged her, and she too held on to him tightly, as if afraid to disappear. However, the Duke was more frightened than the girl. He was filled with fear that he might harm his wife with his own hands. 
Having made a decision, he called Faithful Talon. He ordered him to deal with the criminal as his wife wished and ordered. The knight obediently bowed to the master, promising to carry out his order. The duke held Lily by the shoulders. He also wanted to tell her something. Vlad claimed that the reason she had to close her eyes was because of himself. They had already discussed this with her before. Then, sitting together dressed on the edge of the bed. Then the girl voiced her guess, and the duke only nodded his head in response. But then she didn't really believe him. He told her to look at him. Wasn't it obvious from him? He considered himself so ugly that it might be unpleasant for others to look at. The girl considered her husband quite handsome, even handsome. And she asked him who told him that he was ugly. She assured him that he was handsome, and his appearance is not terrible at all. Vlad was amazed by his wife's words. He thought that she was flattering him in a very believable way. And he considered this the reason why Talon and Ivan became so attached to her and were devoted to her. The Duke argued that she should also know about the rumors that were circulating about him around. They said about him that he was a cruel killer in whom royal blood flowed. But he is still the prodigal child of a depraved monster. The girl remembered how, on the way here, the nanny told her something similar about her new husband. Vlad said that he was the child of the previous emperor, that he was born as a result of rape, or rather xenophilia, that his biological mother was a monster. Although a beautiful monster, even sexually attractive, she had a woman's body, but instead of legs, she had a huge tail, and that creature gave birth to him. The emperor's father was a pervert, a loving heartthrob. He constantly surrounded himself with beauties and, having seduced them, abandoned them, giving preference to the next favorite. But apparently at some point, he didn't have enough women. That's why he lusted after the monster. The emperor really liked his mother and admired her. And then he indulged in lovemaking with her. And as a result, a half-breed child appeared. People were simply horrified by his ugliness. He had appendages on his head like his mother monster. Everyone called him a monster, and the child just peacefully sucked his thumb like all babies. This is the umpteenth time that an illegitimate child has appeared, but the problem was different. The boy's face was covered with scales and shoots. The servants whispered that the baby was not a man or an animal. They considered him a real monster. The emperor ordered his knights to kill that creature immediately. But no matter how much they bury him underground, no matter how much they throw him into the fire, he didn't die. Although the child was scared every time, and most importantly, it was not clear why they didn't like him, what he was guilty of, or had done wrong. He was so terrible that even his own mother hated her offspring. These were the words that permeated the entire palace of the emperor, the place where Vlad was born. Therefore, the battlefield was a little calmer for him. After all, in the face of death, everyone was equal. This is how Vlad told his story to his wife while sitting on the edge of the bed. He claimed that this is the kind of person he is. The girl was surprised by what she heard and thought deeply. Vlad believed that if he was the child of a monster, then Lily probably did not want such a husband. He was sad, but he couldn't help himself. A woman's thin hand rested on a man's shoulder. Then another girl caressed the duke on the cheek. She said that he really had a hard time all his life. She looked into his eyes. Vlad answered her in surprise, that she always goes against his expectations. The girl did not understand what her husband was talking about. He explained that he considers her such a good person that he would not want to let her go anywhere. Her hand was pressed against his cheek. The duke asked his wife not to be upset anymore by people as low as Tristan and not to give in to such people, following their lead. Vlad convinced her that if she wanted something, let her order it, but not to justify yourself to anyone. The girl was amazed by his attitude towards her and similar teachings. The duke urged her to do so, even if it concerned himself. After all, he was ready to do anything for her. The girl was amazed that she was so important to her husband. She claimed that she was not ready to believe his words now, that he blindfolded her and deceived her that he was the captain of the squad, that if he really cares about her as he claims, then she asked her to fulfill one of her wishes. The market square was lively. Merchants kept an eye on the goods. Shoppers with baskets were looking for quality products. Some were even with children. Talon claimed that he could not believe himself, that the gentleman allowed the lady to go out into the city disguised as commoners. She replied that she was simply interested in how ordinary people lived here. A couple in cloaks walked between the rows of merchants. Lily asked the knight how often he comes here. He said that it depends, that he sometimes came here after military missions, that I recently went with Buttercup to buy gloves for her. The girl was surprised. He corrected himself, scratching the back of his head, which is not here, but in a place where more valuable goods are sold. He said that His Excellency chose gloves that she would definitely like, that he doubted for so long which one to choose. 
The girl looked at her hands and did not remember that her husband had given her any gloves recently, and she admitted that perhaps he just wanted to give her a gift and do it later. The girls were having fun on the street. One of them said that she would go to the teacher. Another doubted that he would pay attention to her friend. Lady Lily watched that picture with sadness. She was sad about her girlhood years. Talon, seeing that the lady was sad, became alarmed, and he asked her what suddenly happened to her. She replied that she was fine, and that she just remembered someone. The office was full of shelves with shelves for books. The girl asked the teacher what monsters were. He told her to watch carefully. He showed her a monster with the body of a lion and the wings of a bird. Then he drew her attention to another, with a female body and a snake tail. He said that if a woman is dissolute, then her body along with her soul begins to rot, and having entered into a relationship with a demon, she turned into a monster. The girl showed the book, and she claimed that it says that this applies not only to women, but to people in general. I asked if that was true. The man answered her with frowning eyebrows, that it is not right for a woman to pretend that she knows something. He recalled that he had previously told her when a woman was allowed to open her mouth. The girl pretended to take water into her mouth, puffing out her cheeks and closing her lips tightly. She thought that he had just told her not to pretend that she knew something. The teacher cleared his throat and continued, that therefore monsters are something terrible and should not exist. But those tenacious creatures were not so easy to kill. The girl clarified that it turns out that a man cannot become a monster. Surprise was written on the child's face, but the teacher began to get irritated. He confirmed the truth of her words. The man argued that women themselves are inferior beings. Therefore, but the girl interrupted him again, asking about platypuses. She claimed that since they have a beak like a duck and flippers on their legs like a frog, it turned out that they were monsters too. She saw one of these from a merchant from the northern continent, and that creature was cute. She began to tell me that she was still in the distant sea. But the man interrupted her with a shout. The man's ears were already falling from the girl's unrestrained chatter, but she just giggled at her teacher. That's how these children were giggling just now. It was the most wonderful time when worries did not yet fall on one's shoulders, and the whole world was unknown and full of colors. The girl admired the children playing nearby. She said that she herself was once just as carefree. Lady Lily looked around and called Talon, thinking that he was nearby listening to her. But the night was not nearby. The girl was a little confused. After all, she did not know the area and was here for the first time. She couldn't understand where he had gone. Several hours passed. Evening was already falling on the city. The girl shivered a little from the coolness. She thought that she shouldn't have gone looking for Talon without knowing the way. S had to stay where he was and wait. A few minutes ago, she walked through the aisles and was offered to buy various goods. Bread, fruit. They invited me to come into their stores. The girl understood that Talon was responsible for her and was probably looking for her and was very worried. She didn't know what she would tell him when they finally met. Someone in a hood was watching her from around the corner. Lily first decided to return to where she came from. The guy continued to follow her. Returning to the market square, she saw it completely deserted. The sunset rays painted everything golden. She found herself feeling as if someone was watching her. A hand rested on her shoulder. The man grabbed the girl. He said she should be careful, especially in places like this. The two of them stood around the corner, and they saw one man stealing fruit. The girl pressed herself against the man. She thanked him for saving her. But he took off his hood, and it was none other than her Vlad. She wondered how he ended up here. But he said that he had heard a rumor, that the most beautiful girl in Arcadia is walking here alone. Lily asked if it was not worth catching the robber now, but Vlad claimed that Talon had already caught him. The Duke looked at his wife. He said that these clothes suited her very well. She asked at what point he was following her, and she said that she wanted to enjoy the secret walk alone. They walked side by side. Vlad claimed that he was sad because he could not see her, and then she suggested that since they were so dressed up, why don't they spend the day here? They walked the streets like an ordinary young married couple. Then they went to a local hotel. There, no one really carried them in their arms. The Duke didn't really like being here. The girl was already lying on the bed, and he muttered that it wouldn't work that way. But Lily convinced him that this was quite a good place to spend the night that there are places where there is no heating even in the coldest season. The Duke argued that he could not allow her to sleep in such a place. She argued, answering that he will be next to her, and she made cute eyes at him. Lily told him to go to bed quickly. He obeyed his husband, although he was not happy with such an idea. The girl turned to him and pressed her whole body against him. He asked what she was doing, but she answered that it would be warmer to sleep in an embrace. The morning sun was shining through the window. The girl yawned sweetly, waking up, 
Next to her was her bare-chested husband. She was lying on his chest. When she realized this, she immediately jumped up, asking what happened. The man lay smiling contentedly. He told his wife that she could continue to touch him. She asked when he managed to wake up. And why is he naked? Vlad replied that at dawn the fireplace went out and it became quite cold. Therefore he decided that it would be warmer to sleep naked in an embrace. Lady Lily told the man to get dressed quickly. The wiry muscles competed on his arms and torso. She said, remembering one of their conversations that this was her order. The man grinned contentedly in response. The six maids fussed about, sorting out outfits and jewelry. Lady Lily walked among them in a beautiful dress. She wondered what all this was about, and why suddenly. They explained to the girl that these were gifts for my lady, that the advisors specifically personally selected them for her. Gorgeous dresses hung in a row of different colors and styles. There were also boxes with rare jewelry, and one was special. It was a necklace with a huge blue stone. Lily knew it was black opal from the western mountains. The product with it was of the highest category. The maid was not surprised that her mistress was good at this. She had also heard that she had once played a significant role in the merchant's guild. The girl put the product back and drew attention to the books on the table. She asked what it was in front of her, pointing to one of them. The maid explained to her that these were catalogs of finishing materials that would be used to repair the door. She assumed that he could have gotten here by accident, mixed with dress catalogs, apologizing. The maid said that the mistress could look at them and choose a dress for herself, but Lily replied that she wanted exactly the catalog. The servants argued that these little things should be entrusted to the workers. She said that since the position of chief assistant is now vacant, she offered her help if needed, and she took the book with her. Lily replied that this was not a small thing at all, that this is a job on which the house and servants are completely dependent. I was wondering how long the position of the chief assistant had been empty. She said that none of those who wanted could even start a conversation with his lordship. There was something that always displeased him about their greeting. Therefore, the position remained vacant. Lady Lily asked her to prepare everything so that this place would be occupied again as soon as possible, and she personally took it upon herself to look at the materials for construction and repairs. The maid asked her to forgive her for not being well informed about it, and the girl was going to ask her a lot about budget management, but she thought that if she needed to find out more about this, she would probably turn to her advisors. Talon dragged the man by the shirt. He told my lady that he had brought that criminal. The duke sat at the head of the table, resting his elbows on the tabletop and intertwining his fingers. Behind him also sat Ivan, Duke Val, and other significant persons of Arcadia. A fairly young, red-haired, and bespectacled Hayes Stoflo spoke. He believed that the people of Cadiz should not live so isolated. He urged that the gates should not continue to be closed to the imperial delegation, asking about the princess. At least they shouldn't be as open as other duchies. Ivan supported the speaker. He claimed that the chief advisor had put his life on the line for the position. He began to deny it, that he hasn't put his life on anything yet. But Vlad hit the table with his fist. He argued that if outsiders come here, even if they don't touch the sick and disabled, then why did Tristan, knowing his risks, still intend to kidnap the workers of his castle as prostitutes? The advisor answered quietly that the man was going to sell those maids at a high price to one cruel pervert. The duke answered angrily, what if he knows about it himself, so that he no longer dares to talk any nonsense in front of him about openness? Ivan cautiously asked whether Mr. Tristan would still have mercy. Vlad squinted his eyes and answered that we must follow Milady's will, and let it be as she decides. The man was kneeling in front of Lady Lily. Dandelion hurriedly ran down the corridor. Tristan humbly told the girl that it was all thanks to her. He would say, Thank you, Lily. Just a few minutes ago, two of his lordship's guards were leading a criminal under the arms, and a boy walked next to them. The man claimed that Lily called him herself. He hoped that she had already decided everything about him in the best possible way with the duke. Dandelion couldn't believe it, but he insisted, throwing it over his shoulder, that she had never left him in trouble before. Tristan claimed that his goal had already been achieved, but the guy thought that he had to stop him no matter what. The criminal sat in front of Lady Lily. She was wearing a luxurious dress and sat comfortably on the sofa. Behind her stood faithful Talon. He sincerely thanked Lily for stopping the duke's actions. He asked how he could repay her. The man claimed that he constantly thought about her, and judging by her silence, he decided that she was agitated by his words. He believed that he could persuade her. The girl turned to Tristan. She had a sad face. She told him that he was no longer her friend. The man was kneeling in front of her, completely confused. Lily accused him of planning to make her people sex slaves, that he came here to keep an eye on her herself. But the man sarcastically replied that someone from the merchant guild should do the work that he was doing. 
Tristan claimed that he lived his entire life as a victim, just like her. Lady Lily became even more sad, her eyes sparkling with tears. He started yelling. That may be not everything, but she must understand him. He crawled over, remaining on his knees, and placed his head in her lap. Tears flowed from his eyes. The man said that even if she turns away from him. But Lily did not let him finish. She claimed that she had left him alive, but that was all. She pulled him away from her at a respectful distance with her hand. Lady Lily asked the condemned man never to seek a meeting with her again. She stood up and turned around, moving away from him. Tristan didn't count on this at all. She said that, if it were not for the ransom from the guild, she would not have pardoned him. Therefore she advised me not to forget to thank the head of the guild for this. Tristan asked the Duchess. Was she really going to tell her father everything that happened here? The criminal's face suddenly changed expression. He reasoned, what reaction will the guild head have to what is happening? And will he just leave Dandelion? Faithful Talon grabbed his sword, seeing that they were trying to intimidate his mistress. But Lily stopped the movement of his hand with her gesture. Then Dandelion ran in. He called his sister. He apologized for being late, because it was necessary to see off the Duke. Lady Lily continued her interrupted conversation with Tristan. She insisted that she would not change her decision. What will keep him alive? But let the law of Arcadia decide the further punishment. She didn't understand why Tristan had changed so much, but I wanted to tell him the truth, that she and her life here were much better than clinging to him and crying. Lily believed that it was necessary to request information about suppliers of gemstones and communication routes, and because they escaped the death sentence for Tristan. Besides this, you need more. But her husband interrupted her. They sat waddling on the sofa. The girl laid her head on the man's shoulder. He kissed her forehead. He said that she should rest today. What can she tell him tomorrow about what to ask from the Merchant's Guild? She thanked Vlad. Dandelion told the Duke everything, about how their mother died because of Lily. She confirmed that this was true. The girl said that the mother gave all of herself, taking care of her daughter, and her health was getting worse every day. Vlad, seeing his wife's anxiety, took her hand. He argued that when a person dies due to illness, it is a misfortune, not a murder. That such misfortune happens to everyone. That's what happened to her one day. The man hugged his wife. She hid her face in his shoulder. He said that when she was around him, she shouldn't pretend that everything was fine. Lily looked into his eyes with gratitude. The man tilted his face for a kiss. They sat like that for some time, not looking away from each other. The girl pulled away from her husband's lips, slightly out of breath. She asked him to wait a little. She was about to confess something to him, that in fact he is not her third husband, but her fourth. The girl called to her brother to go faster, to admire the younger brothers, how cute they were sleeping. She wanted them to grow up quickly so she could play with them. But the brother replied that he would teach them fencing. My sister was offended, because then who would play with her? The boy advised his sister to turn to her mother, so that she would give birth again and definitely a sister. But the kids woke up and started crying. The children realized that they had woken up the little ones, and the girl took the baby in her arms to rock him again. But then their father entered. He strictly asked the girl what she was doing here on such a day. She asked her father to forgive her, that Antonio woke up and she was helping to shake him. Her brother asked her quietly, what kind of special day was today according to her father? The man claimed that today was a special day when his sister would fulfill her duty. The girl silently looked at him with round eyes, holding the child in her arms. A carriage drawn by a pair of horses was driving along a city street. The girl was wearing a beautiful, elegant dress with bright, huge bows. She asked what kind of place this was, but her father only answered her rudely, that no one allowed her to open her mouth without permission, blamed her for being a stupid girl. The man leaned out of the carriage window and shouted impatiently to the coachman, asking when they would finally arrive. He muttered about how many times the idiots need to be told, but apparently only fists understand. The girl has already witnessed her father's cruelty more than once. He deliberately took her with him during the execution of punishments for his subordinates. She then asked her father to stop, but he continued to sit with a stony face and did not pay attention to his daughter's tears and entreaties. He believed that this was how he developed character and consciousness in the girl. He claimed that the man was suffering because of her. He convinced her that she should obey him and then no one else would be punished. The coachman finally announced that they had already arrived, the father told his daughter that she should never fail. He reminded her that the future of their family depended on her. She was sad, and she simply mechanically answered her father with consent. They were greeted by a short but fat middle-aged man. He warmly greeted the head of Ailes. Shylock Isles claimed that they had come to express gratitude for the invitation from such a noble man. 
He replied that all formalities could be omitted by clapping him on the shoulder. The man spoke into the guest's ear that they were going to become one family, and he considered his daughter simply beautiful. He proposed to get engaged right now, and he thought that it would be good if the girl moved to his palace before the wedding. But Shylock replied that this was different from what they had previously agreed with him about, and did not even know what to say. After all, his daughter hadn't even had her first period yet. But the owner assured that he had no thoughts of doing anything with the girl before the wedding. But if Lily becomes his wife, then it would be better if she already began to get used to life here. He asked if he should write a letter of guarantee to his merchant guild. The girl cried hearing all this. The man promised to transfer exclusive rights to sell copper from his mine, and Lily understood that she would be a bird in a golden cage all her life. The baron replied that the owner's ability to negotiate was simply amazing, and he extended his hand as a sign of agreement and confirmation of their deal. The men shook hands firmly, sealing their agreement. It turned out that Shylock Isles was simply selling his daughter, marrying her off while still a child. Vlad hugged his wife. Seeing her tears, he assured that there was no need to continue further, seeing the pain on her face. The girl continued to talk, what her father taught her, what she should do with him. But she felt so bad and she wanted to escape, she clung to her sick mother and begged her. And then they ran away together. But their family owed that man a lot of money, and my mother died without receiving proper treatment. The girl still blamed herself to this day. She believed that if she had simply agreed to get married then, her mother would not have died. And the man advised to choose him and blame him for everything, that he brought her here without knowing it and forced her to marry. He couldn't even imagine who he was in her eyes then. What if he only knew what would happen to her? I would never have let her go that day. Five children were sitting in the clearing. They told each other stories, whose would be longer and more interesting. The boy decided to tell about what he overheard yesterday from the adults. His right hand was bandaged, and he was drawing something on the ground with a stick. That for several days now, a monster with red eyes has appeared in the neighboring village. The children listened to him with round eyes in fear, and no matter how they tortured him, he still did not die. The stick drawing on the ground transformed into something horned. Therefore they decided to burn that creature. But even fire was not afraid of him. The girl listened with horror on her face. The boy concluded his story by saying that in the end, the monster survived and ran straight into the forest. The children were scared and huddled together. They heard something in the distance and ran as fast as they could to escape, and only the girl remained sitting still. A guy approached her, and there was something extra on his head, and his eyes were red. She remembered the story about the monster, and she stood up deciding to come closer to him. But she was still afraid and stumbled and fell. The guy extended his hand to her, helping her get up. The girl handed him hers in return. Their fingers touched. She thought that he wasn't so bad after all. She politely thanked him for his help, and she asked him to listen. The girl regretted the words spoken by her friends, and she insisted that their words were harsh, that you can't call him a monster. The guy just clenched his fists in anger and resentment, but seeing the offense on the guy's face, she stopped mid-sentence. He turned to the side and began to run away. He was afraid that they would begin to offend and torture him again. Vlad could not understand why he suddenly remembered this moment of his life. He thought that Lily didn't even remember this episode of their first meeting. His wife lay on his lap and dozed. The morning sun brightly illuminated the room through the window. There were men's clothes on the sofa. The maid hoped that the mistress would not wake up so quickly. The girl wished good morning to Buttercup. Today Lily was in a great mood and looked even better. Lucia blocked the door with herself, convincing the mistress that the bath was not ready yet but the girl assured that she heard a sound from there, as if something had fallen. The girl claimed that she would see for herself. After all, there could be a wet and slippery floor. The maid was rejoicing that they had succeeded. The girl could hardly see through the foggy glass, but it was clear that a huge man occupied the bath. But then, having a better look, she recognized him as her husband. The man has a petal stuck to his face. He was surprised that his wife had already woken up. He asked if she was very frightened when she heard an extraneous and rather loud sound. She assured him that everything was fine and was going to remove the petal from his face. She said that it was more important for her now to remove excess from his face. The two of them laughed at her joke. The girl asked if he prepared all this himself. She praised the pleasant aroma and beautiful petals. The man helped the clothes slide off his wife's shoulder. He claimed that he had prepared a bath not only for himself. Her robe was already on the floor. Vlad said that his wife also seemed to want to swim with him. She insisted that this was not what she meant at all. He warned that it might be a little hot. The water overflowed over the edge of the bathtub when the girl sank into the water too. Lily stood in front of her husband in her underwear. He held her hands and looked into her eyes, smiling slightly. 
The girl decided that her husband decided to cheer her up in this way. Lily bowed her head over her husband. She gently caressed his face. He asked her to move closer to him. The girl thought to herself that she had never looked down at him before. She touched him wherever she wanted. He even let her touch his tongue. The girl understood that he was like this only in front of her, and she really liked it. The man held his wife by the wrist. He asked what she was thinking about now, and kissed her hand. Lily asked if he had anything important to do this afternoon. He smiled back at her and hugged her waist. He said that if it was not something very serious, then he would like to rest first. The girl laid her head on his crown. She asked why he suddenly decided this way. The man pressed her fragile body closer to him and only smiled back at her. He replied that he had to do it for her sake. The knight finally found the duke. He said that while he was resting for several days, he thought that he would not come at all. Vlad said briefly, Tristan. And the advisor guessed the gentleman's whole question. He answered that he had arrived at the merchant's guild, that he had finally returned to himself, and he could not believe that it was possible to offend the lady so much. The cell was already empty. Then it was terrible to watch when the skin on the prisoner's back was torn to shreds, and he didn't even make a sound from the pain, as if torture was nothing to him. The advisor said that at least he understood that it was her ladyship's request, but he believed that it was not worth leaving the bastard alive, and that bothered him. The duke was surprised that he was not satisfied with a simple punishment. Vlad asked what he might have thought, that he, having seen someone make a serious mistake, will stand by. The duke claimed that the Ailes Merchant Guild would be in chaos after Tristan's punishment, and also mistakes in management. He advised us to send good advisors there. The advisor was surprised that the duke was quietly planning to destroy the Isles Guild, but he assured that he was not planning such a thing. This simply could not be allowed to happen. Instead, he was going to make Shylock Isles beg for forgiveness at Lily's feet. A few days later, early in the morning, a carriage harnessed to four horses rushed quickly along a snowy road. The girl joyfully looked out the window. She asked Vlad where they were going. She was dressed in a warm dress and a soft-colored fur coat. Her husband answered her mysteriously that she would see everything herself when they arrived at their destination. She said that Dandelion asked her not to return. It was obvious that if she returned, her father would beat her for what happened through her fault with Tristan. The guy asked him not to kick him out. Hugged Talon, he asked to let him go. Vlad already knew this. Talon told him everything and he promised his wife that everything would be fine. She thanked her husband. She remembered that Dandelion often took the blows for her, because her body shouldn't have any traces of wounds. Therefore, as a child, he received the punishment intended for her. Vlad thought with horror. In what a terrible atmosphere the children grew up, Lily and her brothers. He claimed that he would order a good house to be found in which Dandelion could live. The girl was grateful to him for this. The coachman stopped the carriage and informed the gentleman that they had already arrived. Vlad closed his wife's eyes. She couldn't understand what he was doing. She remembered the past. Then she did not know what a gentle person her husband could be. He told Lily that they had already arrived. When the duke removed his hand from the girl's face, she saw indescribable beauty in front of her. Vlad took her hand and led her inside. He assured that he built this garden especially for her. For days like today, it was a glass greenhouse at the very top of the mountain, and it looked absolutely amazing. They walked along the path. Lily said that her mother spent her childhood in a country where flowers bloomed, just like here all year round. And perhaps that's why she constantly said that her mood improved when she came to a place full of flowers. And the girl realized what this meant only now. Vlad said that he was glad since she liked being here so much. They continued to walk. Lily said that her mother considered flowers to be more than just decoration, and that they are useful from an economic point of view. For example, next to a gold mine grows equisetum, popularly known as horsetail. She stopped short and began to apologize for blabbing so much, but Vlad assured her that everything was fine, and he asked her to tell him more about it. He was really happy to learn new things, but he believed that if he voiced this, he would put her in an awkward position. The girl chose a tulip from the flower bed and decorated her hair with it. I asked my husband what he thought she looked like. Vlad responded with some banality, and then he reproached himself for answering the first thing that came to his mind. The girl was waiting for words or actions from him, and the duke could not bear her gaze. When he decided to open his eyes, the girl was touching a flower with her finger. She asked if by chance there was an ore vein on the Otako Plateau. The girl sat crouched near a row with similar flowers. She claimed that such flowers grow next to a copper vein. The Otako Plateau was a place where in winter, everything dead freezes anew and in the summer it became a desert that burned all living things. It was a depleted land infested with monsters. The duke confirmed that there was copper and granite there, 
the girl was a little embarrassed. She asked this just in case, and it turned out to be true. She was surprised that the lands of Arcadia had everything. Vlad asked if other people knew about this, that if it is easy to find out about it, then you will have to take action. After all, everyone thought that this was just a poor land. The girl replied that her mother taught her this as a child. Vlad thought that his wife was quite insightful and smart, but her abilities never had a chance to shine, because the head of the guild was in a hurry to get married. He felt that she should not waste time choosing tiles for the banquet hall now. He considered her capable of ruling an entire guild. The duke told his wife that when they would return to the palace, he asked her opinion, how she views meeting with advisors. The girl was surprised and a little scared, but Vlad assured her that she could greatly help them. A pale moon lit up the winter night sky through a haze of fog. A woman's thin leg slipped into the water with petals. Lily couldn't believe that her husband had built this place for her. She understood that it took a long time to build such a building. There was just a huge bathroom. The girl sat with her feet in the water and enjoyed making small movements with her feet. And from them, circles spread smoothly across the water. She was waiting impatiently for Vlad. A thin hand sank down into the water, catching the floating flower petals. She remembered his hugs and that weak bite on the neck. The girl went into the bath water and rubbed her neck. She thought with regret that the mark he then left on her neck would remain longer, and she wanted him to leave another one like that. She was horrified by what she was just thinking about now. There was a slight splash of water behind her. Vlad asked what she was doing here. The girl covered her face with her hands. Lily stuttered and said that she was taking a bath. A man approached her in the bathroom. She asked him to wait a little. Water overflowed over the edges of the bathtub. Vlad tore her hand away from his face and asked his wife to look at him. There were two glasses and a bottle of red intoxicating drink on the table. One said that the royal family could not solve the problem with the opening of the duchy, and he doubted that her ladyship could help. The advisor doubted, first of all, that the gentleman himself would want to listen to them. Ivan believed that the alcohol was really strong. His interlocutor asked if he actually listened to him. The priest reasoned that since he had already told the lady everything, it means that she should soon come here herself. They entered the door. Both men immediately turned around at the creek and stood up. Lady Lily entered, joining the company. She was surprised that Abbot Ivan was also here. He politely answered her that we had not seen each other for a long time. Ivan was beaming. He claimed that since he and the Duke went on vacation to Ataco, he expected her to return later. And sometime later, after communicating with the advisor, the Duchess was simply horrified. She saw empty bottles on the table. Ivan believed that if this continued, it would be the end for everyone. Both Cadiz and the gentleman himself could be hit. The advisor, also pretty tipsy, took Lady Lily's hand. He claimed that she was the only one who could save Cadiz. And then an acorn flew into his temple. He gasped in surprise. Ivan asked the lady not to worry, that he always behaves like this when he drinks. Lily asked to clarify that he meant the end for everyone. The abbot explained that the duchy has almost no interaction with the outside world. That, given the use of the precious resources of the Ataco Plateau, the duchy can be considered completely self-sufficient. But it was difficult to develop agriculture and trade here, the girl asked in surprise, and this is all because Vlad refused to open the dukedom. Ivan calmly and sensibly explained to his mistress that in the opinion this could make the lives of citizens more dangerous, that thanks to the duke, Sick and unhappy people were able to find a new life here, but when opening the territory, they will have to endure the views of others, and problems in public order may also arise. And instead of constantly being exposed to danger, it is better to live day by day in anticipation of death. As Vlad is, so is this city. The Duke sat at the head of the table, surrounded by advisors. He ordered the temporary reorganization of part of the security forces into the protection of the citadel. And he added after a short pause, he considered it necessary to fill security gaps by banning entry and exit after sunset. The Count Gatekeeper bowed, answering that the order of His Serene Highness would be carried out. Another raised his hand, asking permission to remind him of the agenda. Vlad answered who they would continue when all the meeting participants arrived. He didn't understand who else they were waiting for. After all, their entire usual composition was already at this table. A woman's heel clicked on the floor slab. The men greeted her ladyship. The girl under such close gaze began to feel a little shy and timid. The men all stood up, and the girl said that she was glad to finally meet all of them in person. They replied that it was a great honor for them. Vlad asked Lily to pass, and gave her his dominant place at the table. He said that this was her place. She smiled and thanked her husband. She started with the introduction, that I joined them today because I had to tell them something. 
The men waddled and listened with grins on their faces. The girl continued with the piece of paper in her hands, that after returning to the palace, she conducted research about the flowers growing in the duchy. And among those, 63 species grow in approximately the same place. One advisor decided that his lordship had clearly fallen head over heels in love with his lady. Another asked him to forgive him, interrupting Lily. And he argued that this was not the place to sort out flowers. Vlad gritted his teeth in rage. He asked how he dared to say such a thing to his mistress. His hand was clenched into a fist. But Lily put hers on top to reassure her husband. The duke looked at his wife and argued that she did not need to convince anyone below her. But the girl firmly told him that she wanted this herself, and this was her own approach. The men all sat quietly, only glancing first at the duke and then at his wife, and she was like a warrior woman. Vlad suggested moving on to the main thing. He looked at Lily, and she looked at him. She unfolded the paper. She said that according to the results she received. All 63 species growing in Otako County are metal-resistant flowers. This meant that there was a deposit of at least three types of metals in the mountain range. The men began to ask again, stuttering. For them, such a statement from a lady was incomprehensible. The Duchess continued. What could be said with confidence about the presence of saltpeter and red copper ore? There was also a high probability of finding tin there. Ivan assured that if their available resources increased, then the roads could be put in order. And then he promised the lady that he would not be too far away from the opening of the dukedom. Lady Lily looked into her husband's eyes and was all glowing with happiness. She said that it would be nice to have a celebration in honor of the opening of the city. But Vlad did not share her joy. He said that unfortunately, they would not be able to open the duchy. She asked him to think it over again. The advisors were also surprised. All is one. But the duke firmly answered that there could be no compromise here, and he put his wife's safety first. The girl asked to listen to her. She argued that if Cadiz became open, it could develop towards the capital, where the imperial family lived. But all the men were horrified. Ivan told his lady that here in Ataco, it was forbidden to mention anything connected with the emperor and his family. Vlad clarified with his wife that she wants to make Cadiz look like a capital. Ivan asked to excuse the gentleman and her ladyship, but Vlad interrupted him, saying that he was not asked. The duke told Lily that criminals were no different from vermin, such as rodents. His gaze was serious, that every time there are more and more of them, and ultimately it is no longer possible to get rid of them, that as soon as a gap appears into which they climb, it is no longer possible to close it. He maintained that as long as her and civilians' lives and safety were at stake, he would not tolerate any objections in this regard. The Duchess placed her hand on her husband's. She said in a gentle voice that he would always be by her side. She said that as long as he didn't leave her, she would be safe. Lily continued to convince her husband that it would be enough to simply install a control system in which only traitors who have received documents will be able to enter and leave the city. And if someone dares to harm the residents of the city, then the criminal code of Cadiz will be applied to him. Or, Vlad was a little distracted from his wife's speech and thought about it. The truth was that he knowing the need to open the city, was against it. And for sure Lily, who spent her whole life in the merchant guild, felt crowded here. Lily saw her husband struggling with himself. Vlad claimed, holding his head, that he was deciding to do this only because he believed her. And first of all, it was necessary to create the right system. The advisors were amazed. After all, it seemed that the fragile Lady Lily was able to convince his lordship, although it was like an impregnable fortress. The duke offered to discuss specific plans after his return, Lily was surprised to hear her husband say this. He argued that it was necessary to recruit people into the army to help Otako, and this applied to the members of the Cadiz security service and all the knights of the fortress. The advisors answered, That's right, and it will be done. The duchess looked at her husband with frightened eyes. She didn't understand what he was talking about, Vlad told, that before they went to the glass greenhouse, a request for help came from Otako, and then he didn't tell her about it. The couple have been together for such a long time. We walked and enjoyed life, flowers and the presence of our partner and mutual caresses. Vlad justified himself that he did not want to give rise to unnecessary worries, and I decided not to share what I had not yet decided for myself. Lily blamed him for hiding this from her. She claimed that she was his wife, and she thought it strange to say that there was no need to discuss this with her. She became sad, and a tear appeared from her eyes. She said that he did everything right. After all, she's just his wife. You could marry her without her consent, without even revealing your face. She decided that with or without a husband, she should look after the dukedom, share a bed with Vlad and give birth to an heir. She was simply a person fulfilling her duty and bearing the duties of a duchess. 
After all, even enjoying life was too much for her. So by what right can she tell her husband what makes her sad? Tears dripped from her eyes, running in rivulets down her cheeks. She turned her head sharply to her husband. She clarified that if he suddenly dies, then she... The girl did not finish, but Vlad understood everything. He began to convince Lily that he was not going to die at all, that he is only coming to stop someone else's death. The girl realized that she could no longer hold him. She could only try to drown out the melancholy in advance. She tried to bury her face in his chest and wet his dress coat with tears from her cheeks. Lily stood on her toes and craned her neck to reach and kissed her husband on the lips. She invited him to spend this night together. After all, they were not soon to meet again. Vlad was on top of the girl between her legs, pressing her thigh to his and stroking her forcefully, rising higher to her buttock. Lily looked into his eyes and reassured him that he could continue. The duke clenched his fists and began to make guttural sounds as he entered him. The girl echoed him in her own way, smoothly swaying her hips to his rhythm. At some point the man stopped. It seemed to him that his wife had a fever. She assured him that everything was fine, that she can continue. The duke only now realized that even the trip itself was not easy. And upon their arrival, his wife was exploring a mountain vein. He assured that her health came first in any case, but Lily reminded them that this was their last night together. Her husband carefully covered her with a blanket. It was unclear to her. After all, most men would like intimacy before a long and dangerous trip, even if we had to use force, especially wanting his wife to give birth to a child after the wedding. She did not understand why Vlad did not allow her to fulfill her duty every time, but he just looked at the floor and was silent. He thought, child, duty. He told his Lily that he was surprised at what she had been doing all this time out of a sense of duty to him. The girl assured that not everything, of course, Vlad added that not much. He grabbed his head, realizing that he had made her afraid again. Lily sat down next to her husband on the bed and began to caress his cheek. She asked her to forgive her, that she shouldn't have done that at all. She cried and asked Vlad not to leave. He gently touched her face, testing the temperature on her forehead with his lips and kissing her at the same time. He looked into her eyes and reassured her that even if they don't have a child, he still won't kick her back to the aisles. The Duke played with a lock of her hair. I asked him not to see him off today, but to take care of himself in his illness. Three people in jackets stood under the wall. The girl was walking in a dark dress along the garden path. She was sad and wearing dark makeup. She thought to herself if she had made a mistake again. The girl understood that by insisting on a child and clinging to her husband, she most likely looked like a typical cunning swindler. She thought that in such a case it was truly terrible. And then I heard footsteps nearby. She was a little wary. After all, it was already late. A hand fell on the Duchess's shoulder, and the voice said, Sister. She turned around cautiously, but it was her brother. He wrapped her shoulders in a warm cloak. Lily yelled at him a little because he scared her, and then he smiled and asked what she was doing here. After all, even during the day it was cold here. The girl asked Dandelion why he was not sleeping either. He replied that he came because he was worried about her. He knew that when something bothered her, she always came to the garden for at least some kind of peace here. The guy claimed that even though Tistan had left, his father would certainly send someone else to check if his daughter is carrying the Duke's child. Lily looked at her brother and wondered when he became so mature and insightful. I agreed with the correctness of his words. Dandelion asked him to forgive him for not being able to help in this situation, and it turned out that every day only got in the way. Lily placed her hand on his head as a sign of gratitude. She insisted that she appreciated him staying here, and she was glad that her brother was with her. She laughed, looking at his confused face. He looked up at her and claimed that she had changed a lot, that she didn't look like her old self, and he assumed that it was all because of the Duke. The girl asked him not to say that. They walked together along the garden path. The guy said it was true, and he laughingly claimed that he felt relieved knowing that the Duke was next to her. Lily herself knew that her brother was right. After all, here she felt calmer, that next to Vlad it seems to her that she can overcome everything, and she can change too, become a strong-willed woman a support for her husband and their entire dukedom. The girl asked if she could cope without her husband. After all, sending him to a place almost infested with monsters. She sat at a table and drank tea by a lonely lamp. Lily thought what if something bad happened to her husband? Then she will definitely endlessly regret all her life that she let him go to war. Sunlight streamed through the window into the room. The white-haired man claimed that he had put all his efforts into giving her the position of duchess. He was nervous and smoked his pipe. But his daughter thought narrowly and did not see her prospects, turning out to be ungrateful. He was surprised that she only blindly followed her husband. The interlocutor agreed with him. The red-haired one replied that it was not that little Tristan who should have been sent, 
but him, making a gesture that represents all its beauty and significance. It was Krikos Isles, second son of the Isles family. The father glanced sideways at his upstart son. He argued that in this case, there would be no need to lose the trade route, just to get this piece of trash back who calls himself Tristan. The man sat down on the sofa opposite his father. Kriko said that this time he would go there himself, but Shylock was against it, saying that if he loses it too, the business will suffer great losses. The young man crossed his legs. He asked his father not to immediately think about losing him. He took a cigarette from the cigarette case. The son convinced his father that he would return after checking out what Lily and her duke were up to, leaving the merchant guild. Shylock laughed, pleased to have such a son. He was making a move with a round on the chessboard. I asked my son to prepare everything for the trip to the duchy as soon as possible. Duke Vlad was sitting at his desk. The wall of the office was decorated with a shield and a painting with flowers. He quickly wrote something on paper with a writing pen. Even was sitting on a sofa nearby. He said that he did not know why the gentleman had a fight with his wife but perhaps it would be worth at least saying goodbye to her before he left. The duke listened to him with half an ear, continuing to write intently on the piece of paper. Vlad looked up from the paper. He looked dryly at the abbot. He said that he turns out to be too fond of prying into the personal life of a married couple. But Ivan argued that if the duke went to the battlefield without saying goodbye, he would greatly regret it later. I thought that he and Lily would have at least had a child. Then perhaps he could become a consolation for the lady. The duke remembered Lily's words that she considered it her duty to give him a child. He knew that she was kicked out of the family because she did not give birth to an heir from her husband, and therefore he assumed that she was tormented by the fear that she would be abandoned if she did not bear him a child, although he never demanded this from her. But what if she does all this against her will? He was afraid that even those kisses were also out of a sense of duty, which his wife falsely felt. The duke put his stamp on the envelope. He asked Ivan to give this to Hans. He asked him to finish this matter within a month and give it to Lily. He politely undertook to carry out the master's instructions. Vlad stood up from the table, leaning on the tabletop with both hands. The abbot asked where he was going now. The duke, leaving the office, announced that they were leaving at dawn. He told him to wait for him at the fortress gates. Ivan tagged along with the dukes. I asked him if he had decided to go to the lady. But Vlad answered him dryly that everything has limits. For significance, raise your hand with your fingers up as a stop sign. Lily ran in her heels. She called Sir Talon. He turned around at her call, preparing to listen to his mistress. She was carrying a bundle in her hands. The man asked what business she personally came here for. She asked, catching her breath after the rush, if she could see Vlad. He replied that he himself would like to take her to the master, but he had just left the castle. Lily looked at nothing with the offended gaze of an abandoned puppy. Perhaps her thoughts flew after her husband into the distance. She asked how long she would not be able to see him now. There was an assumption that everything could drag on for several years or more. She and her husband didn't even say goodbye properly. Her eyes filled with moisture, but she made an effort to not look like a weakling in front of her subordinate. Talon saw a package in the lady's hands. He offered to convey to the gentleman what she was going to give to him personally through the knights who would follow the duke in pursuit. Lady Lily hesitantly handed him the package. She asked him to hand it over to the duke personally from her. It was her scarf. The duke stood next to the horse, holding it by the bridle and stroking its withers. The noble animal sniffed the cold winter air with widened nostrils, noisily drawing it into itself. A fortified fortress greeted him. Flags with the coat of arms fluttered on the roof and walls. The sun was setting. The knight in the cloak ran out to meet the master, asking what happened that he came back again. Vlad replied that the gathering of the Otako army was going according to plan, without any incidents. But he saw a white bundle in the knight's hands, and he wondered why he was holding his lily's scarf in his hands. He replied that one way or another, but he went to give it to the gentleman and handed it to him. He handed the handkerchief directly into Vlad's hands. He said that the lady asked to convey this to him personally. He held it in his hands for a while and thought about it. Lily? Personally? But then he spurred his horse and rushed away. He was not accustomed to sentimentality. The knight looked after the duke who had galloped away on horseback, and I wasn't sure that this was the same person who left without looking back when the army training began. Snow fell on the fortified fort. A horseman rode through its gate and dismounted. He held a white handkerchief to his nose. Lily's scent was on that piece of linen. A female figure, wrapped in a long fur coat, walked along the path. The duke recognized the silhouette of his wife from afar. He thought that in such a snowstorm it would be easy to catch a cold and develop a fever. But she still goes outside. And the girl was already walking through the door. The man was overwhelmed with emotions. He clutched a handkerchief in his hand. 
I thought that it would be better if he told her then that everything is in order if she so wants a child from him. He closed his eyes, fighting the emotions that washed over him. I told myself that this couldn't be done. The boy was sitting on his knees in the snow next to the lying body of the monster. It had wings and a tail covered in scales. Snow was falling from the sky. She was weak, but she still recognized her son. She asked him not to leave offspring behind. She taught him to live alone and die alone. There were tears in the child's eyes. His mother told him that in this world, one monster like him would be enough. Vlad lived as his mother bequeathed to him for more than ten years, and he couldn't place such a burden on Lily as the child of a monster. He thought that by going into the chapel and meeting his wife, he could only make things worse. The duke stood next to his horse and held his cloak in his hands. He asked the knight when Lily finished her prayer to give her these clothes. The guy bowed and promised to fulfill it. Vlad also asked him to tell her that he received her scarf. The duke saddled his horse and rode away. He mentally conveyed to Lily that he would miss her. The duchess wore a dark dress, and her head was covered with a translucent lace veil. She knelt and prayed to God. She thought that the only thing she could do for her husband, who had already left the castle, was to pray for him. Pray every day for his health and a speedy return home. Lily remembered that every time she was worried about him, he told her in response that she was the only one in the whole world who worried about him. But if she really was the only one in the whole world who was worried about him, she was ready to take on the burden of the rest of the world. The girl prayed. She thought that a long, long winter would pass, full of longing for her husband. And in an endlessly long wait, she will wait and hope for him, day after day. The girl will sit at the duke's desk. She will be thoughtful, and hold a writing pen in your hand. She mentally promised her husband that she would remember him, and these memories would make her smile, and she was going to spend nights thinking about him. And at the end of those waits, whatever news she had to hear, she prayed for strength to accept them with peace of mind. After a few months, spring finally arrived. The servant reported to the lady that his lordship's knight had arrived with a report. Lady Lily turned around with fear and simultaneous hope in her eyes. The knight reported that the monster had swallowed Vlad, that he killed the monster, but could not turn back into a man. The full moon was shining in the sky. Vlad, in the form of a monster, moved between the bodies of the creatures he had killed. He thought that every time he came to a taco, different creatures began to gather. He had wings, and the legs, arms, and part of the face were covered with small scales. His torso was bare. He did not feel cold even in winter. Turning into a human likeness, he took off his shirt from a tree branch to put it on. He felt disgusting, perhaps because I haven't contacted for a long time. And if the ferocious creature had not stomped into the barracks, he would have preferred to fight in a human body. Here his appearance did not matter to anyone. After all, there were frequent appearances of various creatures. But he thought about Lily all the time, and he hoped that she didn't have any special problems there in the duchy. And this scarf of hers. The duke wanted to take it out of the inner pocket of his jacket, but he didn't want to stain it with the monster's blood. Therefore I decided to rush to the barracks to quickly wash myself after the battle. When Vlad returned to their camp, there was quite a lot of traffic there. The knight shouted that the master was returning. The duke entered the gate. The guy asked how the battle with the monsters went. The duke replied that he had killed the latter. But for some time they will not be able to approach the barracks. The knights regretted that they did not know and did not come to the rescue. Vlad replied that it was not scary, and he wondered where the messenger was. He was already ready to listen to the master's order. Vlad ordered to go to the estate immediately and tell Lily that it was now safe here. He understood that she was the only one who cared about him. And at that moment when we left Lady Lily and began to observe the events around Vlad, the girl thought about the worst. The messenger told her that his lordship was safe. The messenger thought that the gentleman must not have shown himself to his wife in the form of a demon. And so I hesitated about how to tell her correctly so as not to scare her. And he couldn't explain the fact that he changes his appearance in every battle. The Duchess insisted that she would understand if it was difficult for him to say. She assured me that there was nothing wrong with it, that she, too, was to some extent prepared for the inevitable. But then another participant came through the door. He asked her ladyship what had happened to her. He was a red-haired and always positive advisor. He claimed that there was commotion outside, and in his hands he held a box with a mechanical lock. Lily said that Vlad fought with demons, and that she was worried that something bad had happened to him. The advisor claimed that even on the day when the master first brought her here, he also fought with the monster. For Lily, it was a revelation. This meant the day they first met, when a wolf-like monster attacked their carriage. Vlad was also in danger. The messenger confirmed the words of the advisor, and he said that the lady had nothing to worry about, that he saw with his own eyes that the duke was safe, 
and that he had come to convey the news that everything was all right with the master. Lady Lily sighed with relief. She said that she was glad that Vlad was not wounded in the battle. The advisor completely forgot the reason for his visit, and then I just caught myself, feeling the box in my hands. Claimed that he was asked to convey this. Lily was surprised and asked what it was. The man opened the box in front of the lady. He claimed that this was a gift specially prepared by the master for her. His eyes burned. And in the box that he prudently opened lay a short-barreled pistol on a velvet cushion. And along with this pistol, the duke delegated to his wife the right to govern the territory of his duchy in the event of his absence. First of all, Lady Lily proposed to conduct an inspection of the property. She reached her hand towards the gun, and she took it in her hands and examined it, pointing its barrel at the ceiling. She said that she wanted to see for herself how the landowners of Cardis were doing. Her brother pleaded. He asked her to talk to them, lowering his weapon. The girl was a little confused. Dandelion said that he was so scared to become, and the advisor asked him to concentrate on the meeting. The red-haired man promised in that case to plan a visit to her ladyship in Cardis. She thanked Hans, and she promised to try to convince Lord Balks. She said she had more to tell them, that she's considering taking over the Isles Guild. The pistol lay next to the drawer, and next to it was a stack of business papers. Lady Lily herself was filled with determination, but her brother was surprised, and the advisor was no less surprised. She replied that it would be difficult for her from the beginning, but she was going to prepare gradually. Hans argued that, strangely enough, this was good news. The advisor claimed that he also had good news for the Duchess. He placed a piece of paper on the table, holding it with his fingers. Hans reported that the situation with sending the administration to the domains, trading with the top of the Ales Guild, that they persuade you to trade ore with them, and not with the Guild. He claimed that his master entrusted him with this work before leaving the duchy. Lily was surprised by Vlad's decision. The men rejoiced. They unanimously insisted that perhaps they wanted the same thing with her, and at this rate she will soon be able to achieve dominance. Lady Lily, shyly and covering herself with a fan, insisted that she would definitely become a villain. But she didn't know if it would work out. Hans assured her that everything would definitely work out as they had planned. Dandelion caught himself remembering. He said that the guild's prostitutes also reported that Lord Talon had taken them to safety. It turned out that most women entered into contracts under threats, and Talon reported that it would not be difficult to convince those women to leave the guild. Hans started shouting at the guy. He claimed that he should have told him about it first, but he claimed that he wanted to report to his sister. Lily saw that the men were arguing among themselves, and I decided to distract them a little. She smiled at both of them and thanked them with the most affectionate words. The Duchess asked whether their meeting for today was over. The advisor confirmed this. He advised the lady not to overwork herself. Lily sat at the Duke's desk. In her hand was a peacock feather. She thought to herself that even though she had declared that she would take the power of the Guild into her own hands, what could she do next? After all, confronting her father will not be easy. She doubted whether to send a letter to Vlad. She started writing. If you asked him, but then she changed her mind about writing and put the pen aside, deciding that he had already helped her enough. She began to think, what would Vlad himself do in her place? Has he encountered similar difficulties? She realized that it was certainly difficult for him alone. In front of her lay paper spoiled with her inscriptions. She wrote his name and crossed it out again. She mentally sent him a message that she thought about him every day. Lily was lying in her arms on the table. She thought that someday the day would come when he too would miss her. As she fell asleep, she said, Vlad, I miss you. Winter landscape, gazebo, the lone figure of a girl goes to cover. Lily was surprised that this place was unfamiliar to her. She thought that maybe she was dreaming. A man wearing shoes was sitting on the bench of that gazebo. She wondered who it could be there and her first assumption that it was Vlad was confirmed when she came closer and could see a man's face. She called her husband by name. He looked up at her call. She came closer. I asked him why he was sitting here all alone. The girl touched his face with her hands. The duke's hand held the back of his wife's head. The man claimed that he was expecting her arrival. Vlad's head lay on the girl's chest. She hugged him and gently caressed his shoulder with her hand. Lady Lily thought the man was acting like a puppy, and she continued to stroke his hair on his head. When the girl stopped moving her hands, he looked up at her and asked her to stroke him again. He looked at her without taking his eyes off her, and the girl stroked his head. At some point it began to seem to her that her husband was about to start wagging his tail. The girl thought the man was very nice. She caressed him behind the ear and stroked his hair, receiving unusual emotions herself. At one point the duke put his arm around her buttocks and held her breasts with the other. First he smelled her, then he began to kiss her. 
The girl felt languor in her body. She interrupted from excitement and asked him to wait. He gently caressed her mammary gland with his hand. The girl began to moan from a surge of excitement. She asked her husband to wait and stop, realizing that soon he will no longer be able to control his carnal desires. Some of the women's clothing was already on the floor of the gazebo. The man picked the girl up in his arms and sat her facing him. She rested her knees on the bench and held the man's shoulders with her hands. The man said that in her language it means, be closer. They didn't take their eyes off each other. He promised to stop as soon as she told him. Vlad asked her to tell her if she wanted to continue. The girl thought that she would not be able to decide on this. The man sat in front of her on one knee. He said he was a little sorry. The girl did not understand what happened to Vlad. He briefly said legs, and he began to take off her shoes. He claimed that she had them cold. The man kissed her foot. Adj Lily has permission to do this again. The girl laughed and was a little shy about such games with her husband. His kisses began to rise higher. He was already kissing her thigh. He said that he wanted to touch her deeper, already kissing the inside of her thigh under her dress. The girl wondered why her husband always kneels before her without hesitation. Although she was the only one who saw him like this, the girl began to kiss his face, starting from his forehead and smoothly descending to his lips. The man held her legs, being between them. She asked him to be even closer to her until all the snow melted. The duke slept on the table, holding his wife's handkerchief in his hand. When he opened his eyes and stood up, he thought that he could not dream of anything. It was like his lily was in that dream. He clutched the handkerchief, reliving the events of his recent dream. After all, even in his sleep the duke really missed his wife. He smelled its aroma, only subtly perceptible on a piece of linen. He thought that if he had known that this would happen, he would have said goodbye to her properly before leaving. Ivan entered the tent with a report. He informed the gentleman that a letter had arrived from headquarters. He held envelopes in his hands. The duke sat with his back to the speaker and twirled a handkerchief in his hands, pronouncing the name of his wife out loud. The red-haired man came closer. He said that the duke was thoughtful, and that's probably why he didn't hear him. Vlad irritably asked him to speak to the point. He rudely took the envelopes from his hands. He asked to be more careful. He said that among them there was a letter from his wife. Ivan argued that the gentleman was probably thinking about his wife, but he brushed him off like an annoying fly, briefly telling him, Go away. Vlad used a knife to open the seal on the envelope that Lily had sent him. He unfolded the enclosed piece of paper covered in his wife's handwriting. She wrote, Vlad, I'm fine. He thought with annoyance that this is what life would be like without him. He put the paper down, a little disappointed. A few days later, in Cardis, Hans was surprised to hold in his hands a letter with an official seal. He walked with Lily and Count Walkus along the path. He answered her that he had sent her letter with Vlad's knight, but I wasn't sure that he delivered it. I assumed it should have already been delivered. The advisor showed the girl the paper, and she asked him, pointing her finger at it, Is this a suitable place to install streetlights? People gathered around them, wondering what kind of lady was in such a wilderness. One recognized her as the Duchess. The other man didn't believe her words. In the crowd, a guy suddenly started waving his hand at her and calling sister. It was Dandelion. He was all glowing with positivity. The guy ran closer to Lily. I asked when she had time to go out to inspect Cardus's property. He said that if she had warned him, he would have prepared everything properly for her arrival. But Lily replied that it was not scary. But I wondered if everything was fine with him. Lily turned her attention to her brother's forehead. There she saw an abrasion from a bruise. The guy said that of course everything was fine with him. He argued that it was quite good to live alone. And Dandelion laughed to confirm his words. The Duchess approached her brother and touched his shoulder. She asked what happened to his face. He waved her away. He said it was nonsense, that he accidentally tripped and fell. But there's nothing wrong with that. And the guy reminded his sister that she was here to help her subjects. She asked him to forgive him for disturbing her. He said that it was time for him to leave and waved goodbye to her. But the girl asked him to wait. Counselor Hans spoke quietly into Lily's ear. That first you need to greet her people, reminding her that people are looking at her. Count Valkus said in his loud voice, This is Madame de Winter. Be polite. People nearby knelt down, bowed and greeted the lady. Lily thought that she needed to catch up with Dandelion. The Duchess greeted everyone present. She said that the Lord could not attend, so she is here in his place. People from the crowd said they were glad to see her so close. Lady Lily reported that she was here to listen to their stories and explore the lands. She assured that she had prepared food for them, urging them to line up with her to distribute food. People rejoiced at the Duchess's generosity and their luck in being in the right place. But in the crowd there was one strange guy in a hood. He stood for a while and went deeper into the street. 
Lady Lily noticed him. She wondered who it was. She didn't see any more. But that man then entered the village bar. It was quite empty there. Only two visitors and the owner of the establishment himself, who greeted each guest upon entering. One of the guests spoke cheerfully to the other, that he thought that a snow goddess had appeared in the city. He claimed that it was a lie, that the woman was vicious. Another argued with him, claiming that this is how it should be since she is married to a lord. The guy in the hood got involved in their conversation, having said that they have a very interesting topic for communication. Both comrades turned their heads with perplexed glances towards the speaker. The guy took off his hood and asked their permission to sit next to them. The red-haired one asked them to tell him what kind of duchess she was. The comrades looked at each other. After all, fresh traces of blood were visible on the cuffs of the stranger's sleeves. Noticing what bothered them so much, the guy explained to them that he was simply teaching his disobedient brother a lesson, and he probably got hurt a little. The red-haired man told his new acquaintances that he was not their cardis, and they answered that it was obvious. After all, every resident in this city has his own flaw. The guy pointed to his head, claiming that he apparently also had it. The bar owner brought a drink and a glass to the new guest. He argued that it is forbidden to beat relatives here. The fat guest said that since the guy didn't know that, he just wanted to give him advice. That if someone hits a child or a prostitute, that person's head will be on the wall, separated from the rest of the body. The red-haired man slammed the bottle on the table in anger, placing it down carelessly and firmly. A small amount of scarlet liquid splashed out through its neck. The guy replied that he didn't care. He asked me to tell him if the Duchess often came here. The villagers answered stutteringly that she was usually rarely seen. After all, their lord loves his wife very much and values her excessively. The guy cursed to himself, narrowing his eyes. After all, he was sent simply to attack, but it looked like Tristan was right. After all, the duchess's dress was made of expensive, beautiful fabrics. Next to her was a menacing and powerful bodyguard, and even a personal secretary wearing glasses. He slammed his fist on the table in frustration, knowing that the younger brother suffers in the temple and the older sister lives in comfort. The guy decided that he needed to move towards his goal gradually, and first it was necessary to arrange a meeting with Lily. The villagers, having already had a good rest, insisted that it was time for them to leave and said goodbye to their new acquaintance and the owner of the bar. One of them was about to pay, but his pocket was empty. The man wondered where the money could have gone from his pocket, and the red-haired one took out a bag from under his cloak. He told him to look carefully, and then he offered to pay for his new friend himself. He gave the owner gold coins for himself and those two too. The men were surprised that a guy who didn't know them at all suddenly decided to help them. He replied that he was interested in them, but the men replied that it was not at all necessary to pay for them. Another claimed that he now sees that this guy is a kind person. The red-haired guy answered the villagers with the saying, what is swallowed must be paid for. The guy brazenly opened the doors of the room. He narrowed his eyes at the other one who was there. He claimed that it was sad that he was hiding here. Dandelion sat in the corner, brother of the Duchess de Winter. The guy was clearly scared and felt the hopelessness of what was happening. He no longer made any attempts like he did last time. The red-haired man let the villagers in through the doors. He invited them to come and look around his younger brother's house. I asked how they were doing here. The men were a little confused. Crocus made such a welcoming gesture with his hand to his new comrades from the bar. He said that his brother was given such a luxurious room only because he was the brother of the Duchess. He asked if they thought this was fair, and he put his hand on the fat man's shoulder. He hugged both of his new acquaintances by the shoulders. He said that this house, where serfs like them had never set foot, would never set foot until the end of their lives. The men looked at each other in bewilderment. One replied that it was not so unfair. Dandelion stood up and covered himself with a pillow, demanding that his brother not intimidate innocent people and quickly let them go. He said that it was better to let him hit him like yesterday. He obediently lowered his eyes and covered his chest with a pillow, hugging her tightly. The red-haired man laughed imperiously. He broke his brother's will without much effort. He asked if he wanted to fight again. He came up and held the younger one by the chin, examining the traces of yesterday's conversation. Crocus told his brother that he was as stupid as Lily and he expected that he would eventually give in to his demands, just like Lily had done a few years ago. Then the father reprimanded his daughter that she still had no children, even though she was married. He blamed her for not being able to succeed anywhere. Shylock Isles set her brother as an example, that he worked so hard and grew up the career ladder so much. Crocus stood with his chest proudly thrust forward, and in his hand he held a bag of gold coins. The guy put a heavy bag on the table, claimed that Lily must have had her own difficulties, the girl shouted that she also helped them, that she was the one who found the diamond mine. 
Her father claimed that it was Crocus who brought her there. If it weren't for him, it's unlikely that the girl would have been able to find that place herself. The guy began to dispute his father's words. He said that this was Lily, but the head of the family looked at his son with narrowed eyes so much that he did not shut up without finishing his sentence. Shylock claimed that the girl was simply lucky. Crocus stood bowing his head obediently before his father. He was angry with himself for not being able to find that place first, and he looked at his older sister with envy. After all, being in his father's shadow at that age was no longer comfortable for him. Crocus told his father that he would make arrangements for the people sent to the mine. The father warned his son that the work was hard, and so that he is prepared for discontent. The guy claimed that he would take care of this in advance. I thanked my father for his practical advice in managing family affairs. Crocus addressed his sister. He argued that since he would be responsible for power, he asked her to behave worthy of the title of an aristocrat so that she would radiate luxury and calm. He threw a bag in front of her, and gold coins spilled out of it in front of the girl. He said it doesn't matter how good she is. He asked her to stay in her place, saying she's just a bargaining chip. A few weeks ago in the storeroom of the top aisles, three bags tied with ropes fell to the floor at my feet. Crocus said he would rather not ask. The man replied that he would look after the next owner. And this was our Tristan, long left in the shadows. The man claimed that he would no longer be able to see Lily, and I couldn't understand why it could be useful. He thanked Crocus for visiting the Winter Castle, and after thinking about it, he claimed that Lily had changed. It seemed to him as if she had become a completely different person. She began to look at some things, and even people calmly, sometimes even from above, like a true duchess. Crocus told him not to make excuses for his incompetence, that Lily regained her position after nearly losing her own life. But Tristan did not agree with him. He argued that it was not worth going to the Duke's estate. He said that the Duke is like the King of Hell itself. The redhead reported that Tristan had returned upstairs and was spreading rumors about him. He still continued to hold the guy by the chin. He convinced that he should be called Duke Vladimir Winter, the King of Hell. Then he only obediently nodded his head in response. Crocus told him to go to Lily and tell her about it, tell her that it was the serfs who made him like this. The villagers watched with horror in their eyes what was happening between the brothers. Hans told the lady that the inspection of the territory had been certified for today. I advised her to have a good rest today. Lily urged him to go first. The Duchess asked the advisor for a personal request. While she was busy looking around, she missed something. The girl claimed that she had to take care of her family, and the advisor was at a loss as to what was in the lady's heart. She answered him that, in fact, when they were in Cardis, she saw a dandelion, and she was disturbed by his appearance, especially the marks of a contusion on his forehead, similar to a bruise. It looked like someone had deliberately hit the guy, but the maid burst in. She screamed that something was wrong, that a message has arrived from Cardis. Lily warily asked what happened. The girl shouted, Dandelion. She reported that the Duchess's brother was very seriously wounded. Lily clutched her heart. The maid continued to tell her mistress confusedly that Mr. Dandelion was attacked by serfs. The Duchess asked where her brother was now. And where are those peasants? The maid answered that they were imprisoned, and Mr. Dandelion went to the reception room. Lily claimed that she urgently needed to see her brother. Hans assured that he would go with his mistress. The advisor assured that if you ask the Lord of Bark's castle for a peasant newspaper, he will help. Lady Lily was in a hurry to find out what really happened to her brother. She lifted the hem of her narrow dress and ran towards him as fast as she could. She told herself that if something happened to him, she would not be able to forgive herself. The guy was sitting on the sofa in the spacious reception area, his head and shoulders bowed. There were new cuts and bruises on his face. The Duchess burst through the doors towards him. Dandelion raised a guilty glance at his sister. The girl began to examine it and check its integrity. She asked what happened to him. The guy assured that everything was fine with him. His sister held him by the shoulders and looked into his eyes. She said that she saw his lies. She demanded that she be told immediately who dared to do this to him. He replied that he was beaten by peasants, having said that it is the destiny of the common people to live in a luxurious mansion. Lily asked what it all meant. After all, according to him, everything was always fine with him. The guy stuttered and said that he didn't like it here anymore, that besides her, he has no more friends. Tandelion turned away from his sister. He said that he would like to return to his father. The prisoner turned his head to another, sitting in the corner of the cell. He asked if the lady had seen him yet. The other ordered the first to watch his tongue. The third asked whether his interlocutor would forgive the guy who beat up his own relative. Count Walkus informed the prisoners that the mistress was coming. He ordered them to greet her politely and obediently. Lady Lily looked with pity at the pair of ashamed serfs. 
She doubted that these guys could attack Dandelion, telling Valkus this. The couple asked the lady to save them. One said they were just... Another said his brother was jealous. The girl thought that no matter how you looked at them, it looked strange. After all, the peasants were too scared to be criminals. They bowed low at her feet, kneeling in the cell. The Duchess asked the Count if the crime newspaper had yet been published. He replied that he also doubted the guilt of these two, that he had some questions, so he decided to take a break for now. Lily reasoned out loud that perhaps there was someone else with those two. After all, when she was in Cardis, she saw a suspicious man in a hood. She remembered that he was tall and thin. The Count promised to investigate this matter, but he argued that finding that stranger would not be easy. The girl looked into the eyes of one prisoner and then another. She asked me to tell her honestly whether they did it. The fat man, stuttering, insisted that in fact it was all the guy in the hood. The thin one echoed him that it was the one in the hood who then beat the Duchess's brother, and that the same person threatened to kill them if they did not agree to give false testimony. Lily was simply horrified by the lies and injustice. She asked Valkus to lead these people to a safe place. He was surprised. What haven't they? The guys held onto the bars and stood in a lighted area. The Duchess drew the Count's attention to the fact that their hands were clean. And when you beat a person until he bleeds, marks always remain on his clothes and hands. The fat man opened his eyes wide, surprised at the mistress's insight. She told her brothers that she wanted them to be safe on her land, and it was because of her that they were harmed. The Duchess sat on her knees next to the serf and looked sweetly into his eyes, asking him for forgiveness. The prisoner brothers bowed to the ground. She spoke words of gratitude as best she could to the best of her origin. They claimed that they would never forget her kindness to them. The Duchess left the cell. She told the security commander that she wanted to meet with other witnesses. She was sure that they probably had something. He politely pointed out to the lady where she should go. He said that the witness was forced to wait in the guard's room. The guy sitting there smiled and quite familiarly said to the Duchess, Hello, sister. Count Valkus was surprised. Lady Lily asked Crocus why he was here, but then horror showed on her face. She asked her brother if it was really him. Could he really beat up Dandelion, their common younger brother? He brazenly replied that she figured it out surprisingly quickly. Lily attacked Crocus. She accused him that he had no right to substitute poor peasants, that if he wanted to meet her in this way, then it was enough to just come himself. But the man doubted that she would just let him in. He came closer to Lily, almost point blank, and he claimed that their father was very angry because of her pranks. Crocus stated with narrowed eyes, that the sister was wrong to consider herself completely safe, having acquired a high position in society.